This is not on. Oh, it is on. Okay, great. Um, okay, so if people could settle down from lunch. Um, we have our first speaker, who is Iris, who is going to talk to us about decision making. Thanks, and um, hi all, and uh, thanks to the organizers. I'm really excited to be here to talk about uh, our quite recent work with uh, my colleagues at Aalto University, Eero Siivola and professors Aki Vehtari and Samuel Kaski, and our collaborators at uh, Johns Hopkins University, Peter Schulem and Professor Suchi Saria. So our the topic is using queries of counterfactual outcomes to improve decision making and let's dive into what that is. So first I'm going to talk about how we can use causal models for decision support and uh, then about the challenges and the active learning appro approach that we um, propose in order to make the decision making more reliable and uh, then I will go through our experiments and I will concentrate on the implementation because we used STAN, as you probably guessed, and um, yeah, I want to show you those. So um, the whole point here is that we would like to learn models that predict what is an outcome of an action. And those models can then be used for decision making where you need to decide what is the best action at which situation. And uh, especially the um, application that I'm going to use throughout this talk is in personalized medicine, where we have um, patients with features X, so the cover, it's about them, and then we have recordings of the treatment that was made to them, A, and uh, then the outcome, what happened to them, Y. And uh, these kind of uh, observational data sets are pretty um, important because more and more data is being collected in uh, electronic health records. And uh, in this kind of data, we need to be aware of uh, causal inference and some problems that might arise because of the observer data. So an, in causal inference, uh, we call potential outcomes the um, outcomes that are results of the actions that haven't or have or have not been made. So we have, um, well, in a treatment case, we have action A to treat, A equals one, or not to treat a patient, A equals zero. And uh, these potential outcomes for one patient or for patient X um, are what happens if they get treated, what happens if they don't get treated. And a uh, uh, kind of um, fundamental problem in, in causal inference is that we never get to observe both for the same patient. That is quite obvious. We cannot treat and not treat at the same time. So typically then we have a set of treated patients and then the control patient group. And what do we want to do then when we learn this? Um, in our application we want to know which action is better and that we can do by comparing the potential outcomes for that patient, uh, which one is higher, so that is presumably better. However, there is a problem because these data sets are typically very imbalanced. There are more control patients than uh, treated patients. And also there might be some uh, confounding. For example, um, sicker patients tend to get more aggressive treatments and uh, more rich people can afford some treatments wouldn't otherwise be available. And uh, typically, um, it's a good thing to include all those confounders to the covariates X, and this is also what we assume. So no unmeasured confounders, but still there is a problem of imbalance that causes uh, um, some of the covariate action pairs to be more rare so that we have higher uncertainty about them in our model. And that can be bad for decision making, as I will show next in this um, really uh, simplified example that I hope to make it uh, clearer. So consider a case where we have um, two possible treatments, circle and triangle, and uh, then we have learned a model um, of what would happen to our new patient who walks into the doctor's room, X tilde. And uh, we have predictions of uh, both potential outcomes. Now imagine that the data that we have about the whole process is as shown here and here. I will who describe this. So on the y-axis, we have the outcome. On the x-axis, we have the covariates. And uh, the observations are marked with the 
circles and triangles. Here on the left, we see what our model thinks, what our flexible model that can model individualized effects thinks. And here on the right, we have the true treatment responses. And uh, for this patient X, we see that um, we have only observed the treatment triangle for those kind of patients. And uh, then our model has fairly well learned that, okay, the outcome is this. The problem is, though, that we have not observed the um, circle. And uh, therefore, our model relies on its prior. It has high uncertainty, but the mean estimate, point estimate, if we take it, seems to be lower, which in this case, lower is better. However, if we make the decision based on this, it's really bad because here we see the true treatment responses and realize that actually um, the patients always got treated with a treatment that is better for them. And therefore, this um, circle treatment would be really bad for this patient. And we want to solve this by including uh, doctors or other experts' knowledge into the model, and preferably interactively, so that while the doctors are making these uh, treatment decisions, they could also interact with the system. So um, our proposed solution is to elicit some kind of knowledge about the previous patients, because then we would know what would have happened to them if they got treated with a circle treatment, for example. And um, uh, we propose two types of questions. First is the directly the counterfactual outcome. So what would have happened to patient XN if instead of this treatment, they got the opposite one? This is maybe um, pretty hard for uh, humans to answer, but if we have a simulator of the system that is very costly to run, then we might have this one. The second one is a comparative question of which treatment would have been better. And uh, these type of questions are typically easier for a human to answer. And uh, then the question of uh, which question to ask is an active learning question, and we use active learning methods uh, to select those queries. And uh, now, as a result, we get two types of data. So we have the training data, which is observational data, and we, then we have uh, experts given data about the counterfactuals. It has different noise, of course, than the original data, and it may also be of different type uh, comparative in this case. And therefore, um, when learning the, in this, uh, this kind of setting, that's why we used STAN, because with STAN it was pretty easy to incorporate this kind of different data and uh, do the learning. And then also we realized that uh, actually um, traditional active learning methods are not very efficient uh, because they do not take this decision-making task into account. So we introduced also a new kind of active learning that looks into the uh, information gain that we get from uh, one feedback from the expert. And uh, we have the outcome of our test patient before uh, we get any feedback and uh, then outcome afterwards. And uh, what happens to the patient um, is the, basically the difference in the uh, predicted distributions after we take into account that there is a decision making maker who will decide action for this patient. And it might change when we get more data. So this is our active learning criteria, but it's not so important for this audience, maybe just showing that uh, you understand what we are doing. So in our experiments, um, we first did uh, with simulated data just to kind of find out that if the uh, idea is sensible, and uh, then with the uh, semi-synthetic medical data. And for the active learning baselines, we used two very widely used methods. One is uncertainty sampling, and the other one is uh, expected information gain. So in the first one, um, we take a binary outcome. So why is some kind of adverse effect, uh, ad adverse event that happens to a patient? And um, its likelihood depends on uh, parameter theta. Uh, which depends on the patient's coverage and if they got treated or not. And uh, then we have the similar setting for this uh, Bernoulli parameter, so that uh, X always gets treated with a better treatment. 
and therefore when we get uh, even if we get about 30 observations we might be able to estimate quite reliably these uh, factual uh, treatment effects but the counterfactuals are not known and therefore the decision making may go wrong and uh, then we model this with a Bernoulli model and put a logistic regression on the theta and to account for the local effects we have a radial basis func features and then interactions between those features and uh, the action. So we have uh, six model parameters beta, which are normally distributed, and then why our observation is just Bernoulli log it, log it which uh, the parameter depends on those uh, betas and uh, actions and the features. Here's the full implementation. I won't go to details. We have the number of data points, uh, the explanatory, the covariates, actions, and then the outcomes a new patient who we predict and uh, parameters and uh, so on. So here are the results. We measured um, in, uh, for nine test patients. Uh, we repeated data generation for 100 times and then um, measured how many times the correct decision was made. And um, the results show that um, when we get more feedback, so here are a number of quer queries increases, we get better in all of these cases. Then the medical data is uh, infant health and development program data set, which is about uh, premature babies who get this uh, program to help the family and then the outcome is uh, their cognitive uh, capacity at the age of three. And uh, there um, we cannot truly know the uh, uh, the potential outcomes, but here uh, this is quite widely used data set in this field. So we have synthetic outcomes which are highly nonlinear and also have interactions. And then we learn a Gaussian process models for uh, each of the potential outcomes. And then the comparative observations are just, uh, we assume that they are from a Bernoulli distribution with a parameter which is the probability of one being higher than the other one. So in this way, we can uh, incorporate both the uh, um, normal observations and then this comparative, and each of them have uh, different noise and different parameters. Uh, we first got this kind of a direct feedback, simulated direct feedback, and see that, okay, yes, uh, our proportion, proportion of a correct decision increases. And then uh, with Stan, we were able to also use these comparative uh, queries and find that, uh, fortunately, um, having this kind of more indirect feedback doesn't really matter. So as a summary, uh, we had this uh, what if questions um, to either human experts or simulators in order to make the decision making more reliable. And uh, for this decision making task, the standard active learning um, was a bit more inefficient, so we um, introduced a new kind of active learning criteria. And um, then I would just like to thank uh, everyone who was involved in this work, especially Eero, uh, who was uh, highly involved in the STAN models. And uh, then thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you. Okay. First question already, and I don't have to throw the cube. I realize I wanted to ask the first question just so I can throw this That's afterwards. That's what I thought. Um, no, but I actually do have a couple of questions about this. One, did you measure the kind of inter-rater accuracy among your experts? Did you give the same cases to multiple experts and see if they agreed? Um, we didn't do that yet, so we only had simulation of the experts. Okay. So we didn't have a real expert. In our previous work, we uh, did have... Uh, two human experts, mm -hmm. and uh, there we had a parameter that estimated how likely they are to be right or wrong. <laughs> okay. So that is how we account. And yeah, that's and you, also can, you can roll in their biases here. as well. You can like build sensitivity and specificity in. So there's like, it's really cool combining with these. Yes, Because yes. actually these kinds of models are what got me into working on Bayes. Yes. And also like the other thing I'm curious about is the expected information gain, mm -hmm. or like mutual information mm -hmm. that you're using. I suggested that in a paper that I wrote, but never evaluated it as an active learning criteria for exactly this kind of inter-rater thing cool. going I, on. So I I'm wondering if you... I want to see the paper. You, Could you send it to me? Sure, <laughs> but I guess you've already answered my question because I wanted to know if it was calibrated, if actually what happened was you were getting like the information gain you were expecting. Mm. 
but probably you are if it's simulated. Yeah, <laughs> so. it's it's simulated. So so, but but we use our model as a proxy of uh, when when we compute the expectation. So it's over our model's yeah. understanding of the problem. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, it's really interesting. I still need to dive into it a bit. Is there some kind of article and or the code available somewhere? Because I just tried Googling for it. Uh, sorry, could you repeat? Maybe I... Oh, sorry. Is the, is the, it looks really interesting, but I want to dive a bit more into it. Is the code or the paper available already somewhere or not yet? Unfortunately, this is not published yet. Mm -hmm. So we ha don't have the code either available, but uh, it will be soon. Uh, also in archive, uh, but just not yet, sorry. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, in the <coughs> elicitation, how do you acknowledge the sensitivity? Uh, the sensitivity to the uh, errors that the sorry? expert... Uh, do you mean the sensitivity to the errors that the expert may make? Well, it's a <coughs> big question. I think you can, you're better to answer that. But yes, what, what, so what, what, what I experience with elicitation is that you carry out a uh, sensitivity analysis and see how, uh, what kind of impact it has if you vary it a little bit. Oh, and yes. Um, so so we, what we did was that we, um, well, we had a noise model uh, for the expert, so that uh, took into account the Gaussian noise, with, uh, but without any bias. And then we also run some tests with uh, where the expert had bias, uh, but it was the, the method was really sensitive to the bias in expert answers. So that is the natural next step to put in model for the bias. Uh, for the expert too. And then of course there is the question of uh, how sensitive this is to the uh, uh, decision makers uh, policy. So if they are going to make the decisions in a way our model assumes or not, so that will affect how effective the decision making of our active learning is. But anyway, a normal active learning will work exactly uh, as normally. Could you give an example of what some of these X's are? Like in this, in your example, what predictors do you use? Okay, so in the um, infant health uh, development program, there were the uh, uh, age of the mother and age of the, uh, I mean, the, how prematurely the child was born. And I think there were also some uh, demographics like their uh, uh, race and uh, then some, um, sorry, I don't remember all of them, but th these type of things, okay. yes. Thanks. All right, let's give our speaker another round of applause. Okay, our next speaker is Alex, who promised me yesterday to talk about pumpkin spice lattes, so hopefully that will come up, and otherwise generally self-tuning holidays. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, uh, <coughs> I'm Alex. Uh, that's Dan, if you want to wave. Um, we work at Revionics. It's a company that does price optimization and sales forecasting for retailers. So uh, we care about um, the sensitivity of sales in any product that is sold by our clients to changes in price. Um, but more generally, we would just want to model sales so that we can get a good estimate on this thing. So. Um, Specifically today, I will talk about uh, modeling holiday effects. Uh, what holiday effects are, every year, um, holiday comes around and it has a multiplicative effect on the sales. And there's actually a pretty good variety of the kind of patterns that you could see it having uh, on the sales. So you could have a very short, sudden spike in sales that's followed by a drop. You could have a sustained high elevation. You could have a gradual ramp up and then a sudden fall off. Uh, sometimes the peak occurs earlier or after the actual official holiday by uh, some amount of time. So we need a pretty flexible mo um, model for this. 
uh, but we also want it to be sparse. We don't want it to try to explain too much because we have other variables that we want to be explaining other stuff. Um, so <clears throat> what, the, um, what a typical solution, what we kind of used to do, uh, it's, it's similar to what this uh, Facebook profit does, also built on Stan, um, which is you give it a list of official holiday dates and you manually specify a window. And within this window, every date uh, in the window uh, takes on a indicator variable that um, is on for any data point that uh, is on that date. And each of these indicator variables then takes a coefficient. Um, and this works OK, but there are some improvements uh, that we'd like to make that the rest of this presentation is about. So. Um, for one, uh, we don't really want to manually specify this window all the time. And if we just say, let's give it a big window and uh, <clears throat> uh, hope it works most of the time, you end up with a, a ton of indicator variables. And uh, you, when we usually, we only have a few years of data. So um, it's kind of, you can sometimes be vulnerable to overfitting when you have that many extra variables. And also, um, they're kind of independent of each other. So uh, you can have a very large coefficient followed by a small one and a large one, you can have this ragged uh, pattern that um, is kind of not uh, desirable. So we want to be able to kind of have a nice, smooth interpolation between the dates and, um, and figure out what holidays are on and off uh, to, uh, to enforce kind of sparsity. So what we do, so we have a, a function of time then that uh, gets, the output of this gets multiplied with the rest of the model. Um, and what it is, it's, uh, it's inspired by a, a generalized normal and a skewed normal distribution. Um, but, uh, yeah, so this first part here, you can see my mouse, right? All oh, right, this is better than the laser pointer. So this first part here, um, it's uh, kind of a generalized normal. So when, uh, when this C parameter is one, it's like a double exponential or Laplace uh, distribution. And the second part is the skew normal part. So it's just a sigmoidal and it helps the distribution be asymmetrical. It's skewed to one side or the other. Um, I, I have to remind you though, this is not actually a distribution that we, we have here. This is just a function of time that gets multiplied with the rest of the model. Uh, so these are the parameters, There's, uh, there are five of them, no, yeah, five, and uh, I'll just talk about each of them briefly. So intensity is just uh, the magnitude of the holiday effect. It can actually be positive or negative, and um, we put a horseshoe prior on it, which uh, encourages uh, sparsity, so it's, I'm not going to get too much into it, you can go to the link, but uh, it's a bunch of Cauchy distribution, so they're, they're fat tails, so they want to be close to zero, but when the data uh, wants them to be further out, uh, they're okay with being further out by a good amount. And um, this is kind of like turning on or off a holiday. Uh, so then the next parameter is the location, mu. This is what allows us to, uh, to figure out when, I, when the peak uh, effect actually occurs at an offset to the official date that is provided. Uh, so when you, when you change mu, this, this one we put a, just a Gaussian prior on it, we don't want it to go too far from the official uh, holiday date because then it's allowed to explain too much. Uh, then we have this sigma, which is the shape. So um, small sigma just means a very short holiday effect, goes up, goes right down. And a wide one is, a, is, is wider. So. Um, then C is the shape parameter. This, this is what I said when it's one, it's uh, double exponential. At two, it's Gaussian. And at more than two, it's this kind of flat top shape, uh, which we see sometimes. Um, finally, there is Q, the skew parameter. So uh, you can see when, it, when it's at zero, it's a symmetrical shape. When it's negative, it's uh, the skewed to one side, a long uh, run up followed by a short fall off, uh, and vice versa. And uh, I, I didn't mention, but all these, um, I haven't mentioned the priors that we put on these. Uh, this one we put, um, we kind of like it to start at a uh, kind of wide location. Um, I'm sorry, at a wide, 
a wide shape. Uh, it helps it find the location parameter better. Uh, I'm not going to get into that too much. This one, we just want it to be between one and two most of the time, but it, it's allowed to go up to four. Uh, and this one is centered at zero, but we allow it to go either way, really. Um, so I mentioned we usually incorporate this as part of a larger model. Uh, so the example I'm going to do, um, we're not allowed to use our client's actual sales data, unfortunately. So I uh, simulated some data that is pretty much exact, well, I mean, I don't want to say exact, but it looks like what the client data would look like. <laughs> um, it's really not exact, it really is simulated data. So um, <clears throat> it's a Poisson regression model, or negative binomial, and uh, where the mean is uh, this e to the, all that stuff, and the, you can imagine x is an independent variable, in our case it's prices, but it could be whatever, and th this b, in our case, this b is what, this beta, this is the elasticity, it's what we care about, so we want to have a good posterior on that. And then the rest is the holiday effect. So you have a list of holidays, and each one gets its own effect, and they get summed up, up here. Um, so that's all on this slide, I think, yeah? Okay, so this is an example of a holiday list that is user-defined, and it, it's what, uh, it tells you how many, what's the maximum number of holidays, um, and the date that they occur on is going to be, that's basically the center of the location prior. So it's the, the first best guess before seeing any data of where the peak occurs. Uh, you could ignore all this stuff on the left. Uh, yeah. So here's a, the example with the simulated data where the red is the actual and the blue, uh, the blue part are draws from that mean of that Poisson distribution. And um, what you see, the, the big, the big uh, jumps are the holiday effect, and then the little ones are just the effect of uh, being regressed on an independent variable. Um, so this is just, well, we fit it. We do have a, a notebook that will be uploaded, and you can and you look at it, and you can see that um, it fits pretty nicely. Um, these are the diagnostics, um, so that worked. Now let's look at some real data. So for real data, uh, again, there's no actual client data, so we looked for a, a public uh, public data that we could use, and we found Google Trends. Uh, so Google Trends is the thing in Google where you type in a search word and it tells you how often it was uh, searched over time. So here we have five years, and this example is the search term is fireworks, and we see how often it gets searched. And uh, what we see is this big spike, and that's 4th of July. And here on the right, I have uh, the draws of the lift parameter, the posterior of the lift parameter. So here you see it's pretty much all the mass is away from zero. It's pretty sure 4th of July is a big holiday for fireworks. Uh, the second one, so the second one is actually this Guy Fox uh, day that I didn't know about. It's on November 5th. I'm American, if you couldn't tell. And um, we didn't have that on our official list, so it tries to fit it with Halloween. And because we have the location parameter, it's, it's basically saying this is Halloween plus a week or whatever. And then the last one I think is New Year's, but because it occurs... Um, a little bit before New Year's, uh, it's confused as to whether, well, I wouldn't say confused, but it, it could be either New Year's or Christmas. The model is amb uh, amb ambivalent between New Year's or Christmas. So if I do a scatter plot between uh, that, I get, I get this. So it says it, it might be Christmas, it might be New Year. Um, pumpkin spice. All right, so this is the search term for pumpkin spice. It's a pretty weird looking pattern. Uh, I don't really know because I don't drink pumpkin spice, but this seems to be like uh, something that happens in November or, or, no, October, because it wants to fit Halloween as the main one. It wants to use uh, the shape, the kind of flatter shape and the wider scale, because it's a, it's a pretty long-lasting holiday. And then it has another little spike here, which I think is a, it's attributing to uh, Thanksgiving or New Year's. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention, we're only fitting this on three years, and then the last two years are holdout. So just to make sure that we're not overfitting, right? Uh, so, okay, so the conclusion is that um, we have this nice little function that with only five parameters uh, describes the, the pattern that the, the holiday is uh, having on the, the, the holiday effect is having on, on whatever data, in our case, sales data or whatever. And um, 
it's nice, it's pretty robust against overfitting. Uh, key is to select good priors. And um, it kind of stands alone and it's easy to incorporate into larger models. Uh, I want to talk about future work a little bit. So this first one, this first bullet point is not actually future work anymore. We implemented it and it works nicely. So what it is, is, uh, well, we implemented one part. So let's say you have a holiday that uh, every year the peak uh, of the effect is on like, uh, let's say it's Christmas trees and the peak is on the 18th of December every year. But then one year that you're training on, it's on the 17th for whatever reason. Well, if you if you just have what we have here, the likelihood is penalized twice uh, by, the, the, by the failure to get the, those sales right. So it's when you overestimate uh, beforehand and when you uh, underestimate um, afterwards. And that kind of makes the fitting a little bit nasty. So what we do is we have a, an error term every year for the location parameter. So the location parameter is fixed a few days or whatever before, before Christmas, but then every year it's, it's able to deviate from that by something that has a normal prior on it. Uh, so then it's only penalized by that much and it fits uh, nicer like that. Um, the other thing we wanna do is model correlation between these parameters. Um, sometimes what happens is you have a, a small lift uh, so it's kind of half a holiday, or it, it's not a very strong holiday, but uh, the location and, sc and the scaling and the other parameters are very large, so it looks like it's just some effect happening far away from the holiday and not too much. So it just kind of gives the model too much power to fit stuff that's probably not a real holiday. And by forcing a kind of prior on the correlation between these parameters, you could probably avoid that. Uh, the other thing we want to do this uh, kind of uh, simpler stuff. So use use this kind of uh, these posteriors to figure out if we're missing holidays from our list, uh, and we want to upgrade the horseshoe prior on the lift parameter up to the Finnish horseshoe or regularized uh, horseshoe, which I'm not going to talk about, but you can go to this link here, and um, that's it. Any questions? not on oh, now um, so two questions is I so what about um, smooth random walk priors for the case where you would have like a lot of you mentioned that there's a problem if you have too many of these indicators of like um, for the for the holiday like this change point indicators for the holiday so is that in profit already implemented I'm, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't solve all the problems you mentioned but have you looked at yeah that? so you could have like a like well, you're saying a smooth random walk. You mean some kind of autoregressive time series model for for, for, for these uh, coefficients associated to the uh, oh change for the points. coefficients. Yeah, you, um, that's something that you could do if you wanted to fix the the uh, the, the indicator variable version of it, which might work. I I don't know for sure, but I, my feeling is it might be harder to fit that. But I can't really answer that with certainty. But that's a good idea. And, and the second one is about about identifiability. Like, if you have a lot of holidays overlapping, or yeah. like in close by, is that some issue? No, here? it is. So that was one of the example was when it couldn't uh, tell if it was Christmas, uh, Christmas plus a few days or New Year's minus a few days, um, and we're kind of okay with that. Uh, so um, I, I guess you could, after the fact, go and qualitatively, based on what, what the search term is or what the product is, determine which is the holiday that's having the effect. But without that qualitative information, you don't really want the, to learn to figure that out just from the data by itself. Um, thank you for the speech. I had a feeling that um, the holiday effects would be different, um, depend highly on what weekdays the holiday is. For example, yeah. if Christmas was on Sunday and if Christmas was on Friday, it, the holiday effect would be quite different. Did you overcome this problem? Or? Yeah, this is a really, uh, really good point. Um, we don't, in this uh, presentation, or uh, we don't uh, explicitly model day of the week. Um, we have that as a separate part. So you could, 
You know, the the sale the, the count model we use for sales is, is a lot more complicated than, uh, than this. We have a bunch of other stuff going on, and day of the week uh, is part of it. So is more like cyclical, like Fourier component seasonality. But for holidays, so yeah, it, it, was, it was one problem where depending on, uh, you know, if it, for example, uh, Black Friday, people go shopping, but people are more likely to go shopping on the weekend anyway. So the the peak wants to be on a weekend close to that holiday. So this was one of the, the problems that, um, when I mentioned the, the first point of the future work, where uh, the location is, there's, there's an ex expectation, there's a mean location, but then every year it might be off by a little bit. Uh, and then the, uh, the extra uh, random variable that varies by year that's put on top of that helps overcome that on a, just a, a fitting case, but not on a forecasting case. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Um, the thing that I'd be, I'd be curious about, uh, you, you, have, you have this you know, somewhat flexible uh, specification where you, you estimate the, the shape parameters for the holiday effect, but I mean, what, what, if, what, if, there's a, what if there's a positive effect and then, then it results in perhaps a decline after the holiday, for instance? I mean, would it, would it be worth adding in a bit more flexibility? Oh, in this regard? yeah, uh, so what you're, let me clarify, what you mean is uh, it goes up, holiday happens, and then it actually goes below the right. mean, right? Yeah, yeah that, that actually does happen, and um, yeah, you could improve it. I, I would imagine what you could do is uh, give it two, uh, you, so one thing you could do is when the, you give it the holiday list, and then for every holiday, you also give it the day after that holiday, and then it might try to fit the first one as positive, and then the second one as negative. Um, yeah, but that's, that's a good point. Thanks. Um, so a quick question about the C parameter that you had because sorry, I, the, the, what? the C parameter in your oh, yeah. holiday function um, because did you mention that it can only be larger than one because with that generalized normal I think like having C to a half is also the interesting yeah. bridge idea yes uh, so to be honest I don't remember if we put a hard constraint on one we have a prior that favors it being between one and two, but I know it can go above, it can go up to four, and I think it can go, I think actually the hard constraint is at zero. I might have misspoken there. Oh, okay. Oh, that, or I might have misheard, yeah. No, I, <laughs> I misspoke. <laughs> I'm pretty, I remember. Okay, I lied. We have time for one more question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so you said you and your clients are interested in price elasticity, so how uh, the price affects the, um, the number of sales. Uh, yeah, right there. I was wondering, uh, have you thought about adding an interaction term with that and the holidays? Because I was thinking if it's like around Christmas time, and your kid really wants like a Nintendo or something, then you'd probably pay more to get that. Uh, have you thought about that? Uh, that's an awesome idea. I hadn't really, well, no, I hadn't thought about it. Actually, actually that's, that would be an interesting, so it becomes more inelastic yeah, closer yeah. to the holiday, right? Yeah, that'd be cool um, to see. That would be cool to see, yeah, I agree. Okay, let's thank our speaker one more time. All right, so our final speaker is Yari, who will tell us about nutrition and uh, Bayesian networks. Okay, good afternoon. So. I'll be presenting uh, hopefully an interesting application of mixed effect or hierarchical Bayesian network. 
and how it's model, modeling the effects of nutrition as a system. So in other words, how food affects your body. So um, I work as a data scientist in uh, CGI, the IT company, and also doing my PhD in the University of Eastern Finland. There I work in a research group that is focusing on uh, nutritional therapies. So we fight for uh, chronic diseases like diabetes with uh, nutritional guiding. And uh, we also provide uh, nutritional research to support the general nutritional guidelines in the Nordics. And my, my task is to study the computational models for personalized nutrition. And it pretty much boils down to questions like these. So uh, I argue that uh, much of our health problems come from the fact that we eat in a way that our bodies are not, not expecting. So we eat whatever, our bodies are giving us signs that please stop. And eventually that we have to take some medication to overcome the issues. But how could we have known that? <laughs> because those uh, general guidelines that I mentioned, they, won't, they are meant for general public, guiding us in the right direction, but uh, they are pretty wide. So, for example, here is uh, one real one from women to 31 to 60 years old. So the therapists know that uh, people are reacting to food very differently, but they don't really have like a statistical tools or measurements to support that, so they are working with their experience and they are doing a really good job. But uh, what we need is a personal version of these. And uh, when we go towards personal understanding, we need some kind of uh, personal response to model against. So in a hospital setting that we are working on, the basic set of blood tests is a good and effective response. And when I first started to think about this problem, I started sketching the supposed connections between the nutrients and their, their bodily responses. And uh, well, as I am a computer scientist and not a nutritional therapist, it started to look like a craft to me. So the problem was reduced to finding the best craft that reacts this or describes this model of the system. So, then we need to just uh, extend this graph as a graphical model. So we take those uh, personal information and nutrients and uh, blood tests as random variables, and then we are having some connections between them. Unfortunately, the finding the optimal graph directly is hard. But again, we can use our Bayes rule to change to alternative probability that evaluates the probability of candidate graph given this data set. Okay, this task may also be quite heavy, but fortunately it can be narrowed down with good choices of prior information. And uh, okay, now, where one having assumptions about the graph structure. So I'm assuming that we are having this uh, bipartite graph with just two layers, the nutrients and the responses, but there could be an intermediate layer that uh, actually implements this mechanism and we could also model that. And we are also, also because this is a Bayesian network and it's a directed can't be loops, so we are only assuming that the nutrients are only thing affecting those blood tests. Okay, you may argue that uh, low blood sugar causes you to eat snacks, but sorry, there's no model support for that. And also those nutrients can't affect directly to each other or need us the blood tests, although there might be such a, such a connection, but the, it's modeled indirectly through the network, and that's where the Bayesian networks excel anyway. And uh, okay, the, this uh, graphical model, it actually, it's uh, alternative to the joint distribution. 
and uh, it has, uh, as we are assuming this uh, Markov properties, we can decompose the joint distribution into local distributions that can be estimated separately. So let's zoom into one of those boxes on the right. And on the upper box, I have opened up this uh, bunch of latent variables from the vector of phi. And uh, looking at the top down, I'm also having uh, priors there. So I'm using a regularized Hoshu prior on betas because I'm learning the, okay, you may know the Bayesian networks that uh, there are a bunch of established methods for learning the structure but I'm using the learning by shrinkage. So I'm starting from a, from a fully connected graph and then I'm shrinking away those unnecessary connections, hoping not to lose too much predictive power, but we also want to see the actual relevant connections to gain some nutritional insights. And as you see, there's two layers of hierarchy. There are the typical level of effect how it's going in uh, population-wise, and then there is this personal level that we are more interested about. And I, for me, this, uh, I like this intuition that uh, if the data contains actually this final level of hierarchy, this personal level, then adding those, those coefficients in the model, uh, it explains the way the noise at the data, those epsilon, and thus it produces a better fitting model. And actually, okay, I also like the graphical model so that you can communicate it better with the, uh, with the experts on the field and see what's going on there. And actually this uh, variance of the personal effect is uh, one we care about the most at this, this phase because it has a nice interpretation. So if it's zero, then we can say that everybody are uh, reacting the same way and those general guidelines are just fine. But if it's uh, above zero, then there is, or there might be some uh, between person variance and uh, there are people reacting different way and that opens up a room for personalization or room for personal recommendations. So let's concentrate on that one. And so far, we haven't talked about the data yet, and this has been like a problem first project. And I've been generating uh, lots of data to see that what kind of effects I can capture, and what can I expect when I plug in a real data for this. And currently we are, based on these findings, we are now gathering new data from uh, kidney patients with kidney malfunction, and they would really benefit from this kind of personal recommendations because they are, every, every kidney patient, they are on a very strict diet because they could really get uh, bad effects from like maybe having too much calcium or like. So we are looking for ways to loosen up their diet if their body allows it to. But for this example, I'm using uh, bit older study, a systemic study, you can Google it up if, if you like. It's, it originally is a randomized controlled trial to study the effects of uh, not Nordic diet, so with whole grain, fish and blueberries. But those controlled groups are not uh, interesting in this, this case because the, we have no assumptions that, or we are assuming that all the patients at the study, they are, if they are responding to, to the food in the same way. So we have uh, 106 patients in the group, and we have uh, four repeated measurements during 12 weeks of the study. I've picked up uh, 17 different nutrients and some personal information and the blood tests concerning uh, insulin, glucose, and cholesterol, the typical things you might, might think of. And uh, well in the data, we have the food diaries that the patients have been typing and the blood tests that have been taken week after those food diary observations. And let's look at the bit, bit sample of the data. And one uh, example effect that I'm using as an example for the rest of the talk. So we study how 
protein at your diet might affect in the insulin level at blood. Okay, so you see that the uh, typical effect is quite, quite flat, but there seems to be a difference between patients, but then again, this might be just a random noise. And let's see if our model can pick it up. So this is what happens at my notebook. There's an R script that uh, implements this graph search. It runs the stand model for every local distribution and gathers up a, a graph object can, that can be also visualized with the JavaScript that is also embedded at the notebook. And we see a small examples how to access this model through these three different layers. So here's the visualization, the whole thing. And the, on the right, there is a notion how to connect this visualization back at the model. So the blue and red lines are the betas, and the gray shade indicates the amount of variance between persons. So just to look at a few things, okay, cholesterol medication works. It lowers the cholesterol, but it also typically raises insulin levels, so it might, might break out the diabetics. And also, one thing, uh, folic acid, it lowers blood insulin. That's also clinically supported, so, so that uh, you, you might have a doctor giving you folic acid if you have a, a risk for diabetes. Now let's zoom in and uh, look for our, our example, protein to insulin and see that there is really no much uh, typical effect, but uh, between person variance is, seems to be high. And let's, let's look at the numbers. So now we are querying the graph object. Okay, we can query the, all the beta, beta nodes and sort them. So here are the typical effects. But how about the variances? We can also query the B sigma nodes and there we have this protein. But this 0 0.1 is just a point estimate, so we are interested about the posterior. And then we go to the stand model. We dig up the local distribution for insulin and then the variance for protein. And here we have a hole to see, and it's just the tip of this posterior iceberg. And you can see that there's quite a difference between like mean and median and maximum likelihood. And okay, it's above zero, but it's quite wide, so maybe we need a better priors for some cl clinical evidence and uh, or just more data. And uh, up till now, you can reproduce this analysis from my notebook. And when I'm going next, here is I use this model or the new data set to predict uh, these personal graphs for individual new patients. And I'm building a software tool for those therapists uh, by which they can produce this kind of nice graphs to show their patients that look, these few things in your diet, they are messing your health and your body. Keep eye on those. And those other things, eat whatever you like. And uh, then also we can, we can compute what would be the optimal diet that would guide your blood values in the right direction. Of course, in mathematically, there are like infinite number of, infinite number of such diets, but uh, then we use our experts to hold us on the ground and see what's, what's practical. Okay, then there is a lot of points to improve the model, but... Uh, like uh, modeling those multi-response cases, as you see that there are lots of things corresponding to insulin or cholesterol. And also some other correlation structure would be nice, but then in this, this data set, we have just four observations. So moving on average wouldn't make sense or wouldn't improve much. But thanks. Any questions? Are there any questions? OK, 
Okay, I have one. Okay. So um, you didn't t say anything about the reliability of the food frequency questionnaires. So I imagine that there's some measurement error associated with how much protein you're actually intaking versus what you report on the questionnaire, which you could take into account with Stan. Uh, I don't yes, know if you thought about that's that. uh, uh, well, the experts know, and they, they have pretty, <laughs> they know how people lie in those questionnaires. <laughs> so. so do you take into account those biases in your model or? No, well, no, it's not like model, but uh, they, they know that, okay, it's, it's reliable enough. But we are also looking for new ways to collect those food, food diaries or just some, some other ways to get into input and also that response, there might be some better way to get the response than the blood test. Uh, hi, so you said hi. you were learning the model structure via the regularizing priors. Yeah. Did you have any issues with identifiability with this approach? Sorry, what? Uh, did you have any issues with there being multiple topologies that would basically work? Uh, well, yes, and of course it depends on the shrinkage at this point. And there's, okay, another way is that you can usually in Bayesian, with Bayesian networks, you first learn the structure and then estimate the parameters. Mm -hmm. You can use also that one. But in, in this way, you can, you can estimate the structure and the parameters at this one pass. Other okay. You mentioned really early on in the presentation that you use expert knowledge to maybe restrict the models that you were looking at. Yeah. Something along those lines. Could you say more about that? Uh, I think it was on slide five, if I'm remembering correctly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I'm working with the domain experts and I, I'm there to just ask stupid questions that the data is showing this and is this the relevant thing to add. And also, we are now like looking new variables. I'd see that in this model, maybe we should add like uh, age as a one predictor. That's probably relevant. Okay, I was wondering if maybe you did things like you know that vitamin C can never affect this output, so we rule out those edges or something like that. Yeah, well, uh, actually, those uh, general guidelines they are based on uh, normal distribution and. Uh, upper and lower boundaries are coming from there. So we, one thing to add is to like, uh, put a stricter priors that are based on the general recommendations. So we can use some more informative priors. That's one thing to add. Okay. Uh, let's thank all three of our speakers again. So we have still one hour before coffee break and in order you to be a bit more alert, all stand up. <laughs> stand on your toes and reach side. And then switch from the one leg to another, switching. Or and then do this running movement. <laughs> and then a couple times go down and up. <laughs> and then a couple deep breaths. This will help the blood flow. <laughs> so you will not... I, I, Guess that uh, next speaker probably can also energize you. You can now sit. Uh, but this should also help because you don't get caffeine until one hour. So next we have Richard McElred. It's quite likely that you all know him already and his book, Statistical Rethinking, uh, which is the one of the best 
introductions to Bayesian statistics. Uh, very nicely written. It's a pleasure to read. And so, please. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been really enjoying uh, talking to all of you about what you study. And so I'd like to pay that back and, and maybe be uh, a fraction as interesting. Um, so I'm going to give a talk which is abstracted away from the computational details, if that's OK. Well, even if it's not OK, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, and the reason for that is the computational details, which I'll list, are things that are all provided as examples in the amazing Stan Manual. <laughs> Just it's the, the best applied stats book on the planet, I think, is the Stan Manual. And, uh, but I want to give you an idea about the, the, the scientific function uh, for my basic research that these, um, uh, let's say, techniques that Stan enables, uh, what they deliver for me. And uh, so let's forget about statistics for a moment and just think about the scientific world that I live in. And I hope, I want to invite you in and, and I hope you're interested in it as well. So uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist who studies humans. And, and uh, the public pays me to try and figure out where people came from and as a consequence how human societies work and why human societies are so different from the societies of other animals. Uh, one thing that humans have in common with most animals, and this is a, a deep puzzle about, about life on this planet, is that we have childhood. Uh, and uh, so consider the elephant, for example. Uh, it's a deep puzzle uh, why it is that such a large and robust specimen as an adult elephant would decide to reproduce by reducing itself to a single cell every generation, an incredibly fragile and delicate cell. And then it has to spend a really long time growing back up right, to the large size again. Humans do this too as well. Most animals do. Uh, there are animals that don't do this, like coral. Uh, coral can just clone, right, make a whole reef <laughs> uh, that way. Uh, so why don't we do that? right? And I don't have an answer for that, uh, but I, what I want to talk about is how the way childhood works in different species and getting to us uh, creates different possibilities. Uh, that everything is kind of bound together in the way uh, animals develop what we call their life history. So consider this dinosaur right here. Uh, this is the starling. It's a very lovely dinosaur. And uh, starlings, like most birds, it, once they reach adults, uh, they can live for a decade or more. Uh, no problem. Even in the wild and in captivity, they could live for 20 years, uh, really extraordinary. And that's not uncommon for birds. Uh, but most of the population dies in the first year. Uh, they have really high mortality. And they grow up really, really fast. And the reason is because uh, they have to fly to get their food. Uh, and you've got you to gotta grow up really fast in that first year. You can't take your time. Childhood is rushed. They have no time for study. <laughs> and this has a big consequence on the structure of, well, dinosaur society, right? That their childhoods aren't times to take it slow and go to college and learn about samplers, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> they just don't have time. They've got to get on with life. But once they've grown up, they've got their way of living and they've got their wings, they can live for a very long time. Stands in stark contrast uh, to apes like ourselves. Consider another contrast. Uh, uh, this is not a hat. Right? <laughs> I think you know, most of you know what this is. Uh, this is a boa constrictor digesting a hat. Right? <laughs> no, <laughs> digesting an elephant. And uh, so, what's interesting about boa constrictors and other reptiles, of course, is that when they come across a very large surplus, like an elephant, they can use it all. Uh, they can just swallow it, curl up under a rock, hibernate for a while, make full use of that surplus. They have neither need nor cause to share that with any other boa constrictor. All right, because their physiology lets them just use it all, swallow it all and use it. We well, cannot do that. If you come across an elephant, I subject, uh, we don't have experimental data to verify this, but you know, <laughs> I think it's true. Uh, you can't use it all yourself right away, right? It will rot before you can consume it all. And uh, as a consequence, many things are made possible in ape society because of our very tiny stomachs. Uh, for trading surplus and creating societies to deal with those things. So people like myself, uh, we're trying to figure out partly how it is that human societies take the forms they do, and our cognition takes the form it does, and our rates of aging take the form it do, uh, form, takes the form it does, uh, uh, and how all these things co-vary in meaningful functional ways. And we 
we explore those questions by comparing ourselves to other animals, often closely related ones like the other apes, but even distantly related ones like boa constrictors and starlings and such. Uh, we have long childhoods during which we're incredibly dependent, uh, but also during which we acquire very complicated um, and highly uh, productive skills that can take as much as 20, 30 years uh, to develop, right? Like, like writing samplers or templating C++ code, or whatever it is <laughs> that one might do. And they're playing the cello, right? Uh, I'm sure lots of people here uh, play instruments, right? It's the musical instrument model for human productivity skills is a good one in the sense that you need a master around to nudge you, but you still have to do it yourself, right? And it just takes time, and there's nothing you can do to instantly become a master of it. So the view we take in, in the subfield that I'm in is that we are a very successful ape, a very successful species, not because we do one thing very, very well, but because we do many different things well in different places where they're locally appropriate. And that we have ways as communities of learning about things that are appropriate in particular environments and transmitting uh, those complex cultural skills and technologies uh, to our descendants. And so, uh, you know, think of humans as a naked tropical primate, right, with no natural weaponry, <laughs> uh, relatively defenseless, um, and yet, uh, we managed to uh, not only survive, but thrive and dominate every uh, environment on the planet, uh, except for Antarctica, right? But that'll, that'll be warm soon, so we're working on it. Um, so, the consequence of this, uh, the structure of this intellectual problem that I've laid out for you, is that um, it's a deep evolutionary question. Uh, if, if you think about the contrast between the data that are available to us for inference, uh, uh, and what's the inference we want to make? The target of inference is where people came from and what are the causes? It's a causal model problem. Why are we different from chimpanzees? Uh, and what's the history of transitions that got us here and made chimpanzees different from us? Um, and you know, this is a, a famous page from uh, Charles Darwin's notebook in which he sketches out the idea that there's been branching processes. And we'd like to know these branching processes and also the causes for the particular branching. The problem, of course, is that the distance between the data available to you to make inferences about this branching process and the data we have at hand is really big, right? The best case study you could design if you had a time machine is radically different from what's available to us even under really nice German funding, right? <laughs> and uh, so that's why my field is really, really hard. Uh, it's also why it's a lot of fun and there's a lot of room for computational techniques to help us make the best and most honest use of the data available. Now, of course, Bayesian inference has a deep history in uh, biology, in evolutionary biology. Uh, Francis Galton, some of you, I know, I'm sure a lot of people here have read this fantastic essay by Stigler. Um, uh, if not, you should, it's great. It's a real easy read. And uh, uh, Francis Galton uh, used Bayesian conditional distributions to understand human heredity. And there's a long history of, of this. And, and biology, you know, became, a, the irony then, of course, is that, I'm a clicker, uh, biology became a bit allergic the Bayesian inference because of, well, largely because of Fisher, not exclusively, but largely because of Fisher. Uh, so Ronald Fisher, who uh, I'm sure most of you know was uh, kind of an, uh, the arch likelihoodist <laughs> uh, or fiducialist or whatever he ended up calling himself, but he was most famous in biology for his, his uh, unification of classic genetics with um, understanding uh, modern evolution and the so-called modern synthesis and made really tremendous contributions to theoretical biology uh, that I think will, will live on long after the other his statistical contributions. Uh, but he also was a very difficult human being and he tried to stop all bays from being done in biology and he largely succeeded, at least in the UK. <laughs> right. I think in France they kept doing it for a long time. Um, and he developed a bunch of, uh, co-developed with other people, a bunch of successful tools which were applied to agricultural trials for the most part. And as a consequence, um, in, in, from the early uh, through the mid and even into the late 20th century, uh, evolutionary biology was using statistical tools which were really designed for controlled agricultural experiments. And this has not uh, uh, fit the structure of our data problem very well. So let me set that up for you. Um, what you're looking at here are the, uh, is a, the best photo I know that summarizes how awful and, and interesting and fun the data are that we work with in evolutionary biology. What you're looking at is, this is a field dissection. Apologies to those of you who are squeamish. Uh, biologists don't even notice, right? Uh, uh, field uh, dissection of a wild chimpanzee that died of natural causes 
and at, we have these at my institute a number of um, constantly running field sites where we study the behavior and physiology of our closest relatives. And when an individual dies, it's an opportunity to collect basic biological data uh, at the particular age the individual's at and so on. But you have to be there to do it, otherwise it's too late, right? So the top on the right hand is the brain of a chimpanzee, which is a very large brain for an animal. Uh, it's, it's less than half the size of the average brain in this room, but it's a very large brain for an animal. In the left hand is a testicle. And uh, <laughs> so just one. And, <laughs> uh, and so this is a great picture uh, for illustrating a basic thing about our closest relatives. This is really, really different from us. Uh, in lots of ways. It's not just the brain that's different. We think about like humans have big brains and we're super smart and that's why we're destroying the world. And, and that's not wrong. <laughs> but it's tremendously incomplete in the sense that everything else is different about the other apes too and everything else is different about us. There are all of these coordinated changes in traits in life history and your rate of aging that go along with the size of the brain and investments in other tissues. Right? Uh, and chimpanzees make radically different investments in, in, in tissues that humans don't. Um, the other thing about this, of course, is that these data are scarce, uh, and this is not the this is like the rawest data possible in a sense. Uh, but this isn't what you analyze. You have to then reduce these data to some kind of quantification, some sort of operationalization about and make comparisons to other species. Um, the data we deal with in my field are, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, my field is fundamentally observational. Evolutionary science is not an experimental science. We do experiments occasionally, but the experiments are deeply unsatisfying, and they don't actually show us uh, the history, the target of inference we're after. Um, the data we deal with are uh, bad, scarce, and derived. Uh, they're bad, they have tremendous measurement error, they have uh, no nice sampling design, they're often just opportunistic, right? You find a fossil, great, you got lucky, you got a fossil, <laughs> right? Your colleague didn't get tenure because he didn't find a fossil, <laughs> right? It's just how it goes. <laughs> um, and uh, they're highly derived in the sense that the things that you collect and measure are not the entities that are theoretically nominated and, and important. You have to do some post-processing and you need a, a really nice measurement model to deal with these things. It's nothing like an agricultural trial. So Fisher's window, his famous stained glass window, is very broken in biology. And the argument I want to make uh, uh, is that this has led to a, an evolution of statistical methods in biology away from the, what Fisher motivated, these, these null hypothesis tests in, in an experimental metaphor, towards uh, much more custom and flexible non-nulled models that take measurement seriously. And in this context, tools like STAN are indispensable. They make the science possible, actually. Uh, there are things that we struggled against and felt ashamed of all the time before tools like this arrive. And this is why I've been such a big booster for the STAN project. It, it makes the sort of science I want to do much more possible. These flexible, scalable, open tools. Uh, and, and point to make here before I give you some examples is that uh, because evolutionary biology is a highly theoretical field, the, the theory nominates the kind of dynamical systems models we work with, we don't get to just pick a model of convenience. We get a model from the basic uh, theory. Uh, and then the fact that we have way too little data to fit the model is no excuse. Right? This is the model that's there. And so we end up with high dimensional inference problems even when we have very little data. Uh, and, and we have to confess to that at least and admit it's there uh, and do the best we can. And that's even before we admit that our data are bad and we have to do a, a measurement model on top of it. So what I'd like to do in the remainder of my time here is uh, first give you a few, uh, 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 how to say this, uh, casual examples of the evolutionary trend. Uh, true cases in evolutionary biology that have motivated this move away from uh, the frequentist uh, experimental metaphor towards the more open, non-null, a complicated model, the, the high dimensional, uh, often bad data situation that most of the cutting edge work in evolutionary biology deals with. And then um, I'll spend the second half uh, talking about a case uh, that I'm working on right now uh, that fits all of this. Uh, it's bad data, it's high dimensional, and only Stan makes it possible to, to produce interesting inferences from it. Uh, and it won't be highly technical. Uh, as I said, the STAN manual contains all the technical details you would need to reproduce my model. <laughs> uh, you just need a few months, <laughs> right? <laughs> but no, I'd be happy to share the code with anybody who's interested afterwards. Um, so uh, let's get on with it. Uh, so these, these are three of the uh, most famous population geneticists from the 20th century, all now uh, deceased. All of them made fantastic individual contributions. James Crow is one of the uh, is famous for uh, 
reasons of DNA. Uh, Ari Fisher, you all know, needs no introduction. <laughs> uh, and Moto Kimura, one of the uh, most uh, prolific um, and uh, famous population geneticists of the 20th century, second half of the 20th century, um, who uh, is a legend, of course, in his home country of Japan and made uh, tremendous contributions to theoretical population biology. And they, all of these people collaborated with one another, uh, especially on a famous project known as the neutral theory. So the neutral theory is this idea that, uh, sure, natural selection is, is an incredibly important force for understanding the design of organisms, but what if you're just looking at molecules? So you're looking at DNA, and it's just a sequence of nucleotides, and you want to understand the patterns of variation in a population of such molecules. Do you need to account for selection at all? And so Kimura had this really brilliant idea that's like, well, let's derive a null model that ignores selection and see what the distribution of alleles would look like. And it's really elegant. It's this kind of thing that people like me, all, we all learn it in our first year of PhD. We study the Kimura model. It has a beautiful derivation. It's just like, oh my god, is this is such a satorial moment, right, where you rederive his result. And it is beautiful. And so this is from Kimura's 1983 book, The Neutral Theory of Molecular Evolution. This is, uh, reproduces a graph he drew. We're looking at the red bars are actual data. I think this is uh, maize, actually. I know not, not the most exciting organism, but at least tasty. And uh, there's lots of nucleotide variation, and this is in a population. On the bottom, we're looking at allele frequency of different alleles. There's large numbers of alleles at particular loci. And, uh, and then how many alleles have that frequency in the population on the vertical. Does this make sense? This is a standard frequency distribution. And the red bars are data. Um, the blue bars are model-based prediction, assuming that all alleles have the same mutation rate. All sites have the same mutation rate. This is a basic Kimura model. Uh, and then uh, the yellowish, orangish color is a slightly modified one where you allow heterogeneity in that mutation rate, a distribution of mutation rates. And uh, I think you'll see that there's a pretty good match to data. Of course, it's not perfect, but this was a really shocking result to a lot of people, you know, who had kind of been weaned on Darwin. <laughs> you expect you need selection to explain allele frequencies, right? And it's like, well, maybe, maybe not. And this is a, I mean, maize is under really strong artificial selection, so there was really good reason to think you would see it here. So the neutral model, uh, if you take it as a null model, it's really hard to reject it, actually. Uh, very, very difficult to reject it, at least if you look at the data this way. Um, here's the scientific problem. So the, the kind of background to this is there's this traditional way of thinking about how we marry uh, uh, theoretical models to data, and there's this straight line narrative, we'll, we say. This is kind of like, you know, the the scientific method. You put on a lab coat, you look through a microscope, and then, you know, you test a hypothesis and such. There's a version of this for statistical modeling, where you have a hypothesis on the left that something X uh, influences Y and Z. Um, you then decide you're going to get serious and make this as some set of process models. And uh, I forget what that model is. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a Lorentz attractor or something. <laughs> and, uh, and then on the right, you decide, okay, there's some set of the variables of this system. We're going to look at the frequency distribution of them and then we can do statistics, right? And this is the basic model of how it works. And if you get, if you have one hypothesis and you make one process model from it, and then you make one sort of statistical instantiation of it, this seems like a nice story. And this is kind of the neutral theory story. We, we write down the null model where you take selection out, some force out, and we ask if it can account for the data. The problem is uh, that in evolutionary biology, there are no unique null models. I'll say that again, there are no unique null models. And the reason is because there are too many different forces. And you can't turn them all off because then you have nothing, <laughs> right? And it isn't like an agricultural experiment where you can say, like, one thing gets a treatment and the other thing doesn't. So there's a, there's a cons kind of consensus null model. I know even then, like, like Fisher and, and Neyman and Pearson argued viciously, I think, about what the null model was. But uh, in evolutionary biology, you can't even get started with it. And so the neutral model is a null model, but it has no unique claim to that. So let me try to, to spell this out. We start with two, you know, blobby kind of general verbal hypotheses on the left. Uh, evolution is neutral, selection matters. Those of you who've read my book know this is from the first chapter in the book. Um, but there are lots of different process models that correspond to saying evolution is neutral. Uh, on the top, you, there could be some classic neutral equilibrium model. This is the Kimura model. Uh, it means there's no selection, and the population is at steady state. You have the same numbers of individuals in every generation over time. That's what's stationary, equilibrium population. Uh, but you could also say that there's no selection, but the population is fluctuating uh, from time period to time period. Why? Because the amount of food changes. There's, there's no selection on different alleles, but from season to season, there's more and less food. Uh, 
And then lots of ways selection can matter. You can have constant selection, where selection favors the same alleles from time period to time period. Or you can have fl fluctuating selection, where seasonally uh, selection favors different things. And it turns out, this is a classic result, uh, happened about you know, five years after Kimura's book, that um, the classic neutral equilibrium model of Kimura and a fluctuating selection model produce exactly the same frequency distribution of alleles. And uh, it's, it's very puzzling. It's this thing that you're forced to study if you study uh, theoretical population genetics. And it has a deeply satisfying conclusion, which I won't explain to you, but I'll just hint it has to do with maximum entropy <laughs> and doesn't everything. <laughs> but uh, there are a bunch of things. So what happened in this literature after this is this moment where theorists realized that we have to compare models. And we have to compare substantial models that, that have forces in it we're interested in measuring. And the null model tradition uh, withered very rapidly in theoretical population genetics after this. Um, ecology had its crisis of neutral models later, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, but these things get replayed over and over again. Uh, another quick example, and then I'll, I'll talk about my own work. So you may have heard about these, these Neanderthal genomes uh, that at my institute in Leipzig people sequence out of fossils, mainly ear bones. You get a fossil ear bone and you can extract good DNA from it and splice it all together. And uh, just a couple weeks ago, or last week was it, there was a new article out from uh, the genetics department in my institute with this hybrid of Denisovans and Neanderthals. I don't know if anyone saw this. Um, and, and the point of all this kind of work is trying to, well, piece together that branching process. We find little opportunistic samples of ancestors, uh, near, near relatives of our ancestors, and we try to piece together these things. Uh, we don't know what they look like, by the way. It's just uh, Science Magazine likes to draw a nice art. Uh, but uh, let me give you um, a real example from this, this line of work that I think illustrates, again, the, the power that the field has moved away from null models because they don't do even really basic tasks. So when uh, the genetics department at my institute started, had the first Neanderthal sequence, the question was, um, can we find Neanderthal DNA in contemporary human populations, right? And you now know the answer is yes. Uh, some of you might be as much as 5% Neanderthal, congratulations. And, uh, uh, but what does that mean, right? So this question of what that means, and the first conclusion would be, oh, that means there was interbreeding, that Neanderthals and what we call anatomically modern uh, uh, homo sapiens, people that look like us have our general body shapes, uh, uh, interbred uh, when anatomically modern humans left Africa. Uh, and so this is the, what I'm showing here. This is called the gene flow model. Gene flow in biology means mating. And um, uh, less than 100,000 years ago, with modern Homo sapiens moving out of Africa and red there, and there's a site of, of intermixing of gene flow uh, where Neanderthals and modern humans mate. Uh, that's one model, uh, absolutely. But just finding Neanderthal sequences in some group of humans outside of Africa uh, doesn't show that. And the reason is because there's another model, another non-null model, uh, which can explain the same data where there's no interbreeding uh, between Neanderthals and modern humans, but instead, look, uh, all hominins, which is what we call human-like, you know, bipedal apes, originated in Africa. That we know. And so if there's ancient genetic substructure in Africa, so that the, the gateway out of Africa through Northeast Africa has this genetic substructure, then every hominin you find outside of Africa could share alleles just because they passed through that corridor. Does this make sense? So we call this the substructure hypothesis. And uh, it, it's, it's to, to distinguish between these two hypotheses, you need to look at the fine-grained predictions about the rate at which the covariance between different alleles falls off as you move away from Africa. And this is a thing we call linkage, and that's what these uh, inscrutable graphs are up here. So the, the details don't matter so much as to say that to even make the basic claim that there's inbreeding, there was interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans, you need multiple models, really subtle, theoretically motivated models to do this. Um, and this is before I talk about how messy and fun the data are, right? right like sequence alignment here is a nightmare, right? Uh, so let me transition to my work. Um, so. Uh, uh, one of the things about understanding what we call human life history, the rate at which we age, what we do with childhood, why have childhood at all, uh, why go to college, things like that, is we make comparisons to our close relatives, the other primates. So this is, uh, uh, I'd say, the most recent and best um, broad-scale phylogenetic analysis of the uh, evolutionary patterns you see in primate brain size and body size and such. It's from my colleague Sally Street at Durham. 
And uh, this is a really uh, a heroic paper. It's fantastic. Uh, she deals honestly with the uncertainty in the tree structure and all. does the best possibly. It's just uh, a really nice paper. And uh, nevertheless, in the discussion, it kind of gets to it, and you see Sally writes in like, and yet this is the deeply unsatisfying <laughs> set of inferences because we don't have the detail of data we need. We're summarizing each species with a single number. There's questions about the measures there. Uh, you're sourcing them from different studies to piece it all together. Uh, it's tough. And of course, it's analyzed like a big GLM. And the issue there is that that's not the way biology works. Organisms are not uh, the features of organisms co-evolve. They co-constrain one another. You want some kind of engineering model of brains and bodies and testicles and all the other stuff that's part uh, of a primate. And uh, so uh, there are, uh, I bring you back to this picture, yeah, and uh, uh, there are people who make models of these things, and that's where uh, we're going with these process model issues. So the basic contrast to focus on would be um, so when a chimpanzee is born, it has uh, about 30% of its adult brain weight at birth, and uh, almost all the growth is in the first two years. By age four, it has almost its entire brain. Uh, it's almost sexually mature, too, uh, by then. Its body and its brain grow at the same rate. Now, and chimpanzees are very smart animals. They're I don't know if, you're, if anyone here has hung out with one, uh, but they're really, uh, they're incredibly clever, <laughs> just unbelievably clever. And, uh, Humans have a really radically different pattern. Uh, we're born uh, with uh, much less of our total brain, uh, a little under one-fifth on average uh, of, our, of our adult brain weight at birth. And there's incredibly rapid growth um, in the early years. Now, those of you who have kids, you've observed this, right? That uh, they stay small for a really long time, but their heads become really awkwardly large, <laughs> right? <laughs> And it's very cute. It's like the cute thing. It's the way you make stuffed animals. It's the same thing, just big heads. And uh, uh, this is an unexplained pattern. And, and part of the goal in, for theorists in my area of work is to develop theoretical models that would explain why it's good for a chimp to be the way it is and grow the brain and the body at the same rate, and why it would be good for an animal like us to instead to postpone growth in body and grow the brain fast. The risk there, of course, you can probably guess, is that you're vulnerable when you're small. And you don't, you know, your main predator now is like, trucks, right, or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> but, uh, but humans suffered lots of predation risk uh, in the past and, and still in some places. And so saying small is risky. There must be some compensatory benefit. And uh, lots of people like myself think that the compensatory benefit is you have to learn how to make a living as a human. And you've got to grow the brain first so that you have storage space. And, but we have to find the evidence to prove this and develop theoretical models to make it work. There's a great optimality style model uh, from Mauricio Gonzalez Ferrero and his supervisor Andy Gardner at St. Andrews. Uh, this is a fantastic, this is the best model of this type uh, where they evolve the optimal life history policy for an organism that wants to uh, survive and reproduce at a maximum rate as an adult. What sort of childhood should it have? And you can put in different constraints and you can get the chimpanzee pattern, you can get the human pattern. It's really great. Uh, it's, it demands tons of data, way more data than we have. And so Mauricio is very honest about this. He's, he's, he's very open about the idea. And he just keeps going around asking people, knocking on doors, do you have some data that could fix this parameter for me? <laughs> right, this is what I need. Uh, it's, a, it's a big mission. So um, he came to my office and asked this question. <laughs> and it uh, turns out we have some data, maybe. So there's lots of data on body size and brain size. And that's part of what goes into this. You want body size and brain size at all the different ages. But you also need skill levels and productivity levels, because what is the brain supposedly doing? Uh, it's getting bigger and it costs you energy, but then it's made, it, allowing you to produce more energy as well. You've got to have that payoff rate. So we need measurements of those things to, to work on these models. So uh, I think about five years ago, um, a co colleague and I uh, wrote a grant to study this, uh, inspired by this sort of model that people like Mauricio make, um, of pulling together as much human foraging data as we could possibly find uh, to ask across age, how does the productivity of an individual increase uh, with age? Uh, culturally transmitted skill. So uh, as you may know, there are lots of weird people like me who are for some reason paid by the public to travel around uh, the world and watch people dig things out of the ground and eat them. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great, great job if you can get it. And uh, so my colleague Brian Wood works in northern Tanzania with these Hadza foragers. He has GPS units on all of them, and, and uh, we know a tremendous amount about their foraging decision making. Uh, they're, they're fantastic uh, microeconomists, these foragers. They're really optimizing of their foraging paths and everything. Really, really clever. 
Um, these are uh, contemporary uh, Ache, Native Americans of Paraguay, um, who are, you know, they're fully wage integrated, they have gardens, but they do a tremendous amount of hunting. And uh, all of their meat product, household meat production is basically uh, hunted themselves with these homemade bows and arrows. And here you see a man showing his son how to track. It's all tracking. Game is scarce. You need culturally transmitted knowledge uh, to be productive. So um, uh, human production is also highly cooperative. It isn't individual against nature. It's individuals against nature in teams. There's tracking and calling in your friends and chasing things down and carrying baboons home and all sorts of stuff like this. Um, and it's also highly dependent on technology, which takes a long time to learn how to make. And so, again, this is, this is from the Hadza. The Hadza are a really great case because they make all their own arrowheads. Um, they, they trade meat for uh, these industrial nails, and then they smith them themselves in campfires into these nice uh, flathead arrows. And then they lace them with lethal nerve poison, that they, which is what you see in the foreground here. This is a resin made from a special caterpillar <laughs> that you can get in the environment. And so it's a very polite society, because every adult knows how to make lethal nerve poison. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, all of the, the point is all of this takes knowledge. And what we want is data on the productivity of individuals across ages so that we can track out what is the brain doing if we think we have this theory that it's making you more productive with time, what's it doing? So I want to be clear. Uh, th this slide is here for the reason that um, everybody in this sample is fully modern. There's no primitive people, right? The, this, all, everybody on the planet is wage integrated and trades with agriculture and plants, gardens, and all this stuff. But hunting and foraging happens in all human societies as well. I don't know how many people here grew up foraging for mushrooms, right? And it's pretty common. And yeah, exactly. So uh, I remember my mom taking me out to, you know, like, not this mushroom, yes, that mushroom, right? The kind of measures. I used to go hunting with my dad when I was a little bit older, uh, all those sorts of things. You find it in many human societies. We focus our, our sample on places where it's not for sale, it's household production. They go hunting on the weekends or in particular seasons of the year, and it's for consumption. Um, and this is, uh, I think it's urban populations that don't do this very much. Uh, of course, there are lots of like pigeons and seagulls in urban places, and maybe, you know, there would be supplements available. <laughs> uh, so uh, with that in mind, we can define the data set here. Um, uh, so my colleagues and I uh, started going around and talking to everybody, calling up everybody we knew who did this kind of work. And, and looking through the literature to find adequate records. And so the minimum specification is um, we, we need the size of the harvest that's returned, uh, kilograms of meat. Uh, most of the records are going to be uh, hunted meat. Uh, I apologize, there's not, not nearly enough data on plant returns. There's a little bit, but not nearly enough. So I'm just going to talk about the meat, uh, which there's a lot more records. So we need the kilograms of meat. We need the labor input, how many hours were used to produce it. And we need to know the identities of the individuals who did it. Particularly, we don't care about their names, but we do care about persistent identity because we want their repeat measures. So we need to link them. Uh, and we want to know how old they were. Uh, and we want to know, if we could, technology used. And by technology, I mean dogs and guns, both of which are highly technical items. And so at this point, we have 40 uh, societies, shown here by the red dots. Um, and uh, the way to think about this project here are my 40 co-authors. Um, Jeremy Coster is my co-conspirator in coming up with this crazy idea. He, he made all the phone calls and got all the data sets from people and then spent a tremendous amount of time cleaning the data, which is the hardest part of this project. Well, no, I should say, this, my bar graph here is to show the hardest part of this project is the, is the data collection. This is many thousands of person hours uh, living in communities with people and they're putting up with the annoying anthropologist, asking them all kinds of questions and weighing everything they eat, which is a little creepy, <laughs> right? And uh, so on. So that's all these, all these people listed on the slide, they did the hardest part of the work. Jeremy then did the next hardest part of the work. Uh, he receives all these data sets. He calls all the people up, gets their data sets, and uh, starts cleaning things. And, and so, uh, and you can imagine, you know, some of these data sets were not, you know, clean. <laughs> they required a little post-processing. The best one was uh, Jeremy received a, an Excel spreadsheet, and he opened it up, and inside the contents were a screenshot of an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> <And> <laughs> So, but hey, we know how to do OCR. We just passed it to OCR and, you know, we had our data. But uh, things happen, right, in, in science. Uh, the last bit is my bit, uh, the little, little uh, uh, pink bit here. Uh, Stan did most of this work, to be honest, and the statistical part. 
Um, all of these things synergetically work together. If there's a, a, a disastrous mistake in any one of these, of course, none of it works. That's the terror of science, right? It's not an additive process. It's a multiplicative process. <laughs> You've got a zero anywhere in the product. It's all zero. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as I said, there's repeat measures. Uh, what makes inference, uh, to the extent that we get valuable inferences here, we get them because we've got repeat measures on individuals, in some cases over very long time spans. So uh, the best sample by far is this uh, sample from Paraguay, where there's been a team of anthropologists working, living with and working with a community of Native Americans there for over 20 years now. And so they've got the first year some of these individuals went hunting. And in 1978, and then up to very recent samples. And I'm going to be looking at the data set only up to 2009, because uh, that's what they've, they've released out and cleaned. Uh, but there's even more study. The, this community is still being studied. Uh, so um, here's the goals. And I'll go quickly through this, because I want to give you an overview, again, about the, the point is why this kind of science needs tools like STAN. It's the kind of thing that makes this possible. And, and non-null model fitting and taking bad data seriously. Uh, these data are bad in lots of interesting ways, right? And there's nothing to be done about that. There's, there's irreducible uh, noise in them that we need to model and take seriously. The goal, as I've tried to explain, is to estimate uh, skill development across age. Uh, we take variation very seriously. There's variation among individuals as well as across age. And so we want to be able to distinguish those two things as a first order problem. There's also variation across places. And that's really big, too, because the ecological variation over the planet is very, very large and the size of the gain. So for example, uh, I'll show you this agouti. Uh, in South America, everything's small for the most part. There are a few big mammals other than people, but not very much. Whereas in Africa, like you can get a giraffe, and that's really different than getting a little gazelle or something. And so uh, the prey size distributions vary tremendously. Um, and we need to uh, think about how that affects skill development and productivity as well. Uh, and I always have this goal in everything I do to push the edge of what I'm capable of doing analytically in the stat software. I'm trying to work at my, the limits of my comfort always, right? I know there are people in the room who share this kind of masochism, right? <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's good. Uh, and so here's what the sample is. There are 40 research sites, 1,821 individual foragers, um, uh, 21,160 foraging trips. Um, so many of these trips involve multiple foragers, because they're teams. And so this is why, as long as they, an individual doesn't always go out with the same partner, we can get some information on their individual skills, right? But there's a team production function that's needed to make this work. Um, so we get more harvest than we do trips, because sometimes harvests get associated with particular hunters on particular trips. So there are uh, almost 24,000 harvests. And as I say, uncountable headaches, uh, which arise from trying to take all the badness in these data seriously. And what are the badness? Uh, there's lots of missing values. Um, not everybody records everything for everybody in every sample. So uh, uh, most values are present, it's, but there's a substantial subfraction of the data with missing values, and we don't want to just throw away all those cases. We want to do the best we can. So we spend a lot of time trying to deal with missing values. In particular, there are missing values on age, individuals for which there was just no credible way to figure out how old they were because most human beings don't care about birthdays. Uh, this is kind of a very recent invention, the idea of birthdays. It's a very self-congratulatory <laughs> sort of thing. It's like, ooh, another year. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's exactly how I am. And uh, also the duration. Sometimes we don't have the labor input, but there's still information, right, in the context of a broader model. There's still information in the distributions. Uh, you can back infer duration from the size of the harvest if in that sample you've got enough durations observed. Um, and technology, in this case, think about dogs and guns. In many cases, we know whether the, the forager was using dogs or firearms. In some cases, we don't, and we don't want to just assume they weren't, uh, because sometimes they do. So we, we, we uh, marginalize over the technology, because they're discrete in the data set. So we do the marginalization strategy. That works extremely well. Uh, and we do Bayesian imputation um, for missing ages and durations. Uh, we have lots of measurement error in addition. The, the other kind of missingness is like partial missingness. Uh, age bins. For some of the ethnographers, uh, the only confident level they could say about a person's age was it's between 20 and 30. 
And that's all they were going to say. They gave us a uniform interval. Uh, other people, we'd push them hard, and they'd give us a Gaussian distribution for the person's age. It's like, I think they're 33 because their brother's this age, and their younger brother is this age, and birth spacing's about this, right? We have these demographic models that we use to try and figure out how old people are in these communities. Uh, so we get a Gaussian error distribution uh, model on, on age in those cases. And of course, age isn't actually Gaussian, but no one's near zero in our sample. So we're, we're going to neglect that. Um, and I say that finally, there's massive imbalance in sampling. Uh, some individuals are observed once, uh, but we still want to use their data. So other individuals are observed hundreds of times in the data. And then some societies contribute way more data to the sample than others. And we want to take the variation seriously in this and do the right thing. And so this is massively hierarchical. Uh, and I'm sure that in this crowd, I don't have to explain what that means. Right. So um, what comes from this is, <laughs> is this <laughs> really fantastic situation where, you know, you take a stroll through the 100 acre wood and you count your parameters, right? And you have, so this model ends up having 27,417 parameters. And that's because the structure of the model comes, it's predated. Before you peek at it, you just know the structure of it. Like, we're going to have to count for missing values. Here's what we're going to do. And then you start counting your missing values. You end up with this many parameters. And that's what you want to do. Stan can do this. Uh, that's the good news. Stan can do this. I'm not sure anything else could. Not that I've tried, uh, but Stan can do this. We're going to sample from a 27,417 dimensional surface. No problem. <laughs> no problem at all. I still, it's such an amazing piece of software. And uh, so, so here's, here's the best slide, right? So part of this is it, the struggle in my field and the evolution of statistical methods in my field depends upon bending this curve up. Right, this is the problem, is, is when we have very little data, uh, the most complicated model we could fit is very simple. So this is sample size against model complexity. Uh, and so when we're on the far left, we can't do very much. We have very little data. We don't get excited. As sample size increases, we start to get ambitious, and we start to fit the models we really want to fit, the ones that science demands. But then we have to start making compromises, and then everything becomes map reduce. And you know, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> right? Uh, and that, I understand that. I've done that too. It, it's fine. And this is the world of big data, I call it, you know, with, with scare quotes, is that you get big data, but you get simple models because it's the only thing you can do in reasonable time. Where I work in, in basic evolutionary biology research, uh, the simple model won't answer the questions you want, or rather, it will indirectly do so, but the parameters, you'll have to squint really hard to figure out what they mean. Uh, so the model that I'm fitting here that has 27,000 parameters, the basic production model is, uh, uh, is, two, is a two ODE model with explicit solutions that describe, if you will, the ballistics of skill, where there are different rates of gain. And uh, that's the model we need to fit, and the parameters in that model are meaningful. They have biological meaning to us, and that means that we can then think about them in terms of other studies if they make sense and have meaningful priors. Uh, so the, what we need to do is bend this, um, uh, sorry, bend this curve up. And Stan has been like a balloon, right, that, that pulls this curve up for us and really makes the science possible. Okay. Um, so Jesus wasn't built in a day, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, you, to build a program like this, uh, it takes time and it takes scaffolding. And, and when you're all done, of course, all this, all this scaffolding stuff uh, uh, goes away, and you wouldn't even know it was there. You just have Jesus. But uh, it, it, there's a process of building this code responsibly. That means you go very slow, right? And you put up the scaffolding, and then you build the feet, and you go up, and the arms go on later, and so on. Um, and then at the end, you can't even believe that you don't know how they put the arms on. Uh, so here's how I did it in this. And this is the thing uh, when I teach students and, and talk to these um, talk to my colleagues about these sorts of projects, I always emphasize this, is there's no magic. There's just inch by inch being very careful uh, and documenting every step and doing one feature at a time and doing it all with simulated data uh, to start, right? So here's the actual life history of this project so far. So uh, initially, five years ago, there was a month of modeling and fake data simulation to think about the ODE system we were building, what credible priors would be, uh, and so on. Before we even had the data set, uh, we then wrote a grant uh, this is before I had my current job, so I needed money. And uh, we wrote a grant to the National Science Foundation to fund this, and we waited some months, and then we got the grant. Yay. And uh, then we started, like, okay, but now we're actually going to work on this project because we got money to do it. Um, and then I developed the first STAN model. It was just had the multi-level structure, 
and uh, got that working after you know what happened, right? Divergent iterations, <laughs> right? <laughs> Lots of divergent iterations, but that's okay. Uh, uh, Monsieur Koleski uh, was available <laughs> to help me <laughs> there, and I managed to lick, get all those divergent iterations out. Um, actually, in that story, maybe this, this is worth saying just, just a couple seconds on, a lot of that had to do with being really careful about underflow. Uh, in calculations in various places, doing everything on the proper log scale and using these like, you know, exp1m tricks and all those things to, to solve those problems. And that, that was actually the biggest thing. Koleski did a lot, but it didn't do it all. Uh, just doing the calculations responsibly and thinking about how floating point works, that's, that's the trick here. Um, uh, so that got working and then I started simulating missingness and uncertainty, putting the badness of the natural data that I get back into it, developing those features with the imputation and marginalization, and then I'm happy to report when I put the real data in finally, the data that my colleague Jeremy delivered to me, it ran, right? That's not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's necessarily the right answer, <laughs> but, but it ran and it was a wonderful moment. Uh, and I took a week off. <laughs> and, no, we're still understanding this and we keep getting new data. I mean, this is the great thing about it is you tell your colleagues about this and they're like, oh wait, I think I have records of these sorts of things. Because uh, most anthropologists do have production records. So, um, let me, let me try to, to, to hurry this up so that you have some time to uh, uh, tell me what you think. I'm interested in your comments. Uh, so what happens? Well, uh, you do your due diligence and you worry about uh, convergence a lot, a uh, tremendous amount. And it did take a lot of work uh, to get this going. And I run these things on an 80-core cluster that we have in Leipzig, and so I can run a bunch of chains at once. Uh, I know that very soon I'll be able to use those cores to much better power to parallelize internal computation. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think I'm going to go right back to Leipzig and, and uh, load up 2.18 on the server and see what I can do. Um, but this runs amazingly well. And uh, the mixing is, is uh, too good to believe sometimes. In fact, I still worry if it's right. <laughs> uh, so let me give you a bit of the science now that we talked about what Stan makes possible and why being able to fit models like this is a necessary part of the sort of science that people like me do. Uh, really, this is due diligence, doing our scientific duty to deal with measurement and attend to the theory of interest. Let me focus on uh, this group that I've already shown you some photos of, the, the Ache in, um, in southeastern Paraguay. Uh, the Ache or a linguistic isolate inside the native Guarani uh, language group that's in, in southeastern Paraguay. Um, uh, over here in, the, in the, the purple, inside the purple, if you will, in, in the bottom right here. And uh, uh, the uh, Ache have won a lot of um, really uh, important court cases for control of their indigenous lands in the last decades. And so uh, uh, that has helped them out a tremendous amount. And uh, they're very, very prosperous uh, people and healthy. They just, as long as they can keep their land, they're doing really well. And as I said, there's this team of anthropologists that have been living there for a long time and actually have godchildren in the community and the whole deal, right? It's this thing about anthropologists. You go live with people and, you know, become part of their communities and, and uh, uh, develop all sorts of complicated entanglements, <laughs> right? Uh, so the Ache data set, looking in the upper left, let me give you a summary. There's 147 uh, unique foragers in this community, which is almost the entire uh, adult <laughs> community that's being studied. These are small, small groups and uh, uh, 14,000 foraging trips over about 20 years. It's a really great data set. What I'm showing you here in these orange curves is posterior means for individuals. That's what each line is. And the black is where we don't have any data for individuals of those ages because there's the youngest forager in, in is about, what is that gonna be, like uh, 17 or something like that. Uh, and then they keep hunting very late though. Uh, all the grandparents hunt. <laughs> in this community and are highly productive, as you can see. Um, uh, skill, uh, the estimated skill function declines very, very slowly, but it peaks really, really late. So I'm drawing you a line there at 37. That's the average peak of an individual before they start decline. So, you know, if you're anybody here who's not yet 40, but creeping up to it, it's like you're at your peak. <laughs> okay, it's only downhill from here. <laughs> uh, people like me in your mid 40s, it's like, you know, we're just sliding downhill <laughs> a little bit slowly. No, but we stay high for a very long time. It's the good news about human productivity. Um, but it takes a really long time to get good at this. And what I want to draw your attention to is this peak is long after the peak in physical strength. This is not, now strength matters in hunting, absolutely it does. For the Ache, they hunt with bows, and these are very big bows. They're not recurve bows you could buy at a supermarket or something like that, and you have to draw them with your own physical strength. Um, but 
physical strength in this population, they, we do have data on this uh, through, through grip tests, uh, peaks in the early 20s. And, but that is not, guys in their early 20s are definitely not at peak productivity. They're a bit distracted, you might imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, posterior prediction checks. Um, uh, so we can compare this against the uh, components of the productivity. So uh, breaking out just the success, do you get anything at all? Raw uh, means at each age are plotted there in the black dots. Again, each, each curve is an individual forager, posterior mean for an individual forager. Tons of variation in success rates in this population. We can look at the size of the harvest. How many kilograms do they bring back? Way less variation here, right? Uh, and this is a consequence of it being South America. Everything's like a Goody and Armadillo sized, right? It's all kind of the same package size of food. Um, and then finally, you multiply these things and you get the productivity curves, uh, which is the thing that the model is trained on, if you will. Um, and you could do this for all of the groups just very quickly. Uh, uh, this is what you do. You can draw up these skill curves for all 40 groups. Some of the groups, there's not enough repeat samples of individuals, so you can't distinguish within groups, tell them apart, and you'll see those are the groups where they kind of collapse to the same mean. That doesn't mean the model thinks they're all the same. It means it thinks their means are probably the same, right? But there's lots of variation uh, in these communities. There are other communities where the differences between foragers are really tremendous. Um, so. Uh, I've been talking too much here, so let me close up and, and offer you a chance to talk some. So, uh, in summary, evolution is not your friend, right? It is, it is a, a sort of hostile to inference. Uh, history has erased most of the data that we would need as evolutionary scientists to figure out what has happened and what made us, and why we have the kind of cognition and societies that we do, and what are the processes that continue to transform our, our societies uh, through time. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, difficult scientific situation. It's nothing like an agricultural trial. Uh, it's not an experimental science. As a consequence, null models have very little role to play in this business. You need substantive, causally inspired models and some way to fit them to data. Uh, so this means since causally inspired models vary a lot across contexts, you need flexible tools to build them and you need tools that can deal with all the additional complexity and high dimensionality that comes from taking measurement seriously, dealing with imputation and measurement error, uh, uh, posterior stratification, all the other stuff you might want to do uh, to, to do the best you can on the public's time. Uh, so uh, often the data are scarce as well, and this only makes it uh, uh, all the more important to do things the right way and propagate uncertainty. So in sum, this is uh, uh, the importance to science and the integrity of science of uh, tools like STAN, the STAN project is it's, it's flexible. You can code an amazing number of things. It's just incredible. Uh, and it's scalable uh, and getting more scalable all the time. And it's open. Uh, and so you, you end up with this incredible community represented here of people contributing bits of their knowledge to it, tremendous documentation. All of those things are part of making way better science uh, so that we can figure out why humans exist. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for your indulgence, and I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah, I, I guess that there's so many hands up soon, but I'm holding this, so I'm okay. using the opportunity <laughs> to... Um, you mentioned entanglement. Are you worried that the measurement process is affecting the, mm. that gathering, hunting gathering? They are wedded? Do yeah. they tr try to hunt more? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we worry about this all the time in my field, absolutely. And the, the data come in, there's some ability to check this because the records come in multiple types. So you've got focal follows is what we call them, where the ethnographer actually goes on the hunting trip usually with like a stopwatch and, and you record everything that's seen and you're just you're you're writing down whether they pursue it or not because there are these optimality decision making models about what you forage for so there's great data sets like that the Aceh data set is like this um, and then for the same communities you could have you'll have records where it's just uh, what you convince people to do is every time they bring something back uh, you watch people leave camp and you mark when they leave and then you mark when they come back and then they let you weigh what they got 
And so you have both kinds of records, and so you can compare them and look at the distributions of mm -hmm. them. And they're very similar. Uh, my experience as an ethnographer is people do not care about us. <laughs> we are weird, but they get used to us about a week in. And uh, we're kind of a source of entertainment because we, we're incompetent, right? We're like, we look, look like we're full grown, but we, we lack the wits of children, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, no, it's, I worry about this all the time, though. No. I will say on this theme, uh, I worry much more intensely about sampling bias in who hunts. Because in, imagine individuals who are terrible don't go hunting as often, and maybe not at all. And then this, this really changes the inference you'd make in this because you'll overestimate how good the typical person is at mm -hmm. this task. Yeah, I worry about that a lot. All right. And then, uh, still on holding this, uh, you mentioned that you're worried that your mixing is too good, <laughs> but um, you got the effective sample sizes which were exactly 1,200. Yeah, yeah. So when you switch to 2.18, they are lower. going to be bigger. Oh, they'll be bigger. I've seen this, yeah. This, yes. Yeah. So the mixing can be so good that you can have efficiency better than when you have independent rows. It's getting better all the time. And, <laughs> and the... Um, before next TANCON, there will be also uh, more about the convergence diagnostics and uh, MCMC efficiency coming. Exciting. Okay, then. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so I really liked the slide that showed uh, model complexity versus amount of data. Mm. And... Um, I know lately there's a lot of uh, observational medical data coming out, um, and I see a lot of people using those uh, kind of simple models you talked about, like uh, the MapReduce stuff, and um, I, I guess a lot of people don't know uh, that their data is bad or, or that it is a thing to have bad data. Uh, how do you think we can get more people uh, to know about that and know about uh, modeling and um, uh, realizing that bad data needs more modeling? Wow. Um, I don't know. Uh, could buy my book. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's a joke. <laughs> but, uh, that's what we always tell people. Yeah, so I appreciate that. But uh, I think that's really hard. There's this basic... I'm very committed to the, the sort of teaching project of this in the community, and I care a lot about that. And I think teaching is the hardest part of the science in the sense that it requires me to understand another person's mind, uh, and, and that's, that's very hard. Um, and that gets even harder when I start interacting with expert communities who, you know, it's, it's a typical experience, I think, for many statisticians. The, the, the expert community knows the topic better than you, but they don't have any formalizations of how it works. And so and you do this, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a necessary dialogue, but it's very difficult, and I don't know how to optimize that. And I don't know how to convince people they need a model when they don't know what a model is. Um, and as you know, lots of people trust the data. Uh, it's like that's what they believe. Um, maybe we need, we need clear, exa simple examples where, uh, to illustrate these cases, things that are easy for people to remember, you know, like this, this Monty Hall game that everybody seems to know about now, right? This example with the doors and the switching. You need little toy examples that aren't, aren't your target of inference, that nevertheless are memorable enough that you can teach communities. They can be memory anchors so they can recognize these things. Uh, that's my best hunch, and that's what I've tried to do in my teaching, is have anchors like that. Thanks. So you showed at the beginning this model explaining body growth and brain growth, say, respect to time. And then you collected all this data and you did all this modeling. And I was won wondering, what did you learn about the original model and if there were oh. like competing models? Yeah, um, that's a great question. The short version is uh, you then, you can take the skill curves that, we, that were up on the slide here and put them back into the model. They constrain the model. So in the original fit that uh, Gonzalez Ferrero did, um, the skill curves are just sort of emergent, right? They, they get pushed out of the model. But there's, there was no skill data to constrain uh, that and then therefore affect the other life history parameters. So the goal is now to put them back in. And we haven't done that, but uh, I, I'm on email with Mauricio uh, from time to time, and uh, uh, we have this ambition to do this now. 
and um, or at least I have this ambition to do this. <laughs> and uh, all of his code is open, actually. And so if I had time, I, I might do this myself. I think it's a great PhD student project, actually, to then stick these things together. Um, the competing models uh, are many, actually. And the quick version of this is that there are people in my field that think that childhood is just waiting. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it's, childhood is long in humans only because we live a long time, and there's this allometric relationship between how long it takes you to grow up and how long you live and across a bunch of animals. And that's possible, actually. I think, uh, not, not to convince you that this is true, it's just that we, there's a genuine disagreement in the field. I think that, that human childhood is actually useful, and that's why it exists the way it does. And, it, and the, the evidence of that would be that the, grain, the brain grows first, and we stay small. The skill data helps because you want to see that increase with the brain. Right? You, don't, you don't want it to be a function of, of physical strength. You don't want it to be purely a function of your body size. Uh, or uh, you want it to have to do with the capacity, in particular memory capacity is what we think. And so you want, going forward, you want detailed behavioral measurements of exactly what they're learning and what it does for them performance-wise. And so other kinds of data we collect to deal with this are things like medicinal knowledge, species knowledge, what do, what do kids at different ages know about the ecology, how many species can they name, do they understand the food web relationships among other creatures, things like that, uh, all this stuff, and when do they start learning this, how do they put it to use? Sorry, this is like a lecture button you've pushed in me, but I'll stop. <laughs> but, great question. Okay, two more quick questions. If they were, if there, if there were one. Okay, and they, they were one. Okay. Uh, others you have to then ask. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned that, uh, and it makes sense, I guess, that most of the hunting is uh, basically a group uh, uh, effort. So how much sense does it make to, well, it obviously makes sense, but shouldn't you look at the uh, group success instead of an individual success uh, in a way? Yeah, quick answer to that so we can get to the other questions before the coffee is, I'd say uh, three-fourths of the data are individual trips, actually. Mm. Uh, it's just in, in the same society, you'll get a mix of these things, of teams of different sizes. And so we, we used a basic microeconomic team production model with elasticities and such. To, the skill ODE plugs into those things, and, and we get those things. Uh, and we've tried out differences with, like, is it the minimum skill in the group that affects the outcome? And so we are. We're predicting the team outcome, but we're using individual skill inputs into these team production functions. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Wow. <laughs> um, is there any difference between uh, men and women in the... Uh, yes. <laughs> um, quick version. There's not nearly as much uh, data on uh, women in this, but there's, there's a good amount in some of the groups, in particular the Australian, uh, Native Australian data that we have. Women do just as much hunting as men do. Uh, they hunt for different things. Uh, so uh, and they, they don't they range at different distances from the base camp. And this makes it pretty hard to do the comparison, actually, because now you've got these different subgroups in the same ecology pursuing different choices. Um, so you can estimate skill curves within women and within men relative within their group, but it's really hard to do comparisons across, actually. And so um, as more ethnographers get, we get the plant-based data back in uh, from other groups. Like with the Hadza, we'll be able to say much more about, about the female contribution to this. And I, I want to say quickly, across most of these groups, women contribute most of the calories to all the individuals. Men contribute something like 30 to 40 percent of the calories uh, in most of these groups. Okay, let's back. Uh, still uh, posters, spotlight, so those who are now presenting posters, spotlight, please. All come here and rest, stay there. And uh, Dan Simpson mentioned that I missed one important part from my uh, the warm up routine. And also because Andrew couldn't come here, so please now everyone take a power pose. So uh, <laughs> shoulders back, big rest, okay, and I will we'll send this to. <laughs> Andrew, and big smile, power pose, and I can't use my own camera, <laughs> and thanks. So is it now or after?
to tell you something about the poster I have upstairs, um, which is all about shrinkage priors for Bayesian penalized regression. Now, I think most of you are familiar with the idea of penalized regression. It is a very useful technique uh, to guard against overfitting. And you can do penalized regression either in a classical framework by just adding some penalty term to your minimization problem, or you can do it in a Bayesian framework, and then your prior distribution kind of serves as your penalty function. Um, so in that Bayesian penalized regression, what you do is uh, you specify a shrinkage prior. And the thing with these shrinkage priors is that, that very, different, uh, very many different shrinkage priors exist. Um, so if you look at the literature, you have like this huge literature on all these uh, classical penalty functions and what kind of priors correspond to those classical penalty functions. And then you have also a whole Bayesian literature that is much more about the local global uh, kind of shrinkage priors. So the horseshoe prior, for example, or the regularized horseshoe. And um, the thing is that all these different shrinkage priors, they want to do the same thing. Namely, they want to shrink these coefficients towards zero. But they do so in different ways, and they have different characteristics. So the whole goal of this project, and what you will find on the poster, is an overview of these different shrinkage priors. And I've looked at nine different priors, which I think are very popular. Um, and then I've tried to compare them theoretically by, um, yeah, you, by writing them in like a scale mixture of normals formulation. You can see that on the poster. Um, and I've looked at their shrinkage behavior in a simple model, uh, but also their empirical, um, how they perform empirically in uh, a simulation study in terms of prediction accuracy and variable selection accuracy. So, if you want to know anything about this comparison about the shrinkage priors, um, come check out the poster. If you're too lazy to walk up the stairs, then you can find the preprint as well. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thanks. Hi, uh, uh, I'm Yi Zhang from uh, Metron Research Group. I'm talking about, uh, uh, I'll be talking about the Bayesian inference with partial differential equations. This would be uh, the first step to a systematic treatment of the partial differential equations in P each stand. So uh, let's say you have a PDE solver or some kind of a model solver and you want to plug into stand. <clears throat> Essentially, your solver would be serving as a parameter, as a mapping from your parameter to whatever you observe, right? Just like many of the stand functions themselves. Now, uh, how do we treat those solvers? How do we plug in those solvers? And how do we treat the uh, uh, sensitivities in particular? Uh, we got several ways to do that. Essentially, we will wrap a function, whatever your, uh, your solver function would be, into a stand and uh, plug it into the auto diff system. Uh, there are several ways to do it. For example, the best way, the best scenario would be your solver will be able to solve a sensitivity problem. For example, here I'm solving a PD problem. It's a basic Laplace equation uh, where uh, the the data, what do we call um, quantity of interest, would be uh, some kind of integral. Here, the integral of parts of the domain. This is a very, very realistic problem in applications, actually. Uh, for example, in fluid dynamics, you want to solve the, what, what you care about is not actually the solution in the entire domain. It's a, it's a solution, the integral of the solution, a part of the domain, for example, around the airfoil, you care about the lift, and that's just the integral of the stress around your domain. So, so this is like abstraction of the problem. And here I'm using a live mesh, which is a has a capability of solving problem with forward and adjoint sensibility. I'm using a adjoint sensitivity analysis and it gives me the sensitivity and we can plug into a stand system and uh, make inference of, of the parameters, which is in red here. And the, uh, obviously what contributed to the problem is the combination, the linear superposition of the of the two parameters, that's why you see a correlation here. Now, this is the best scenario. What's the worst scenario? Your solver doesn't do sensitivity at all. 
but then you can find a difference, right? It's not that bad, actually. Find a difference it sounds boring and, uh, and time consuming. But here I'm showing, actually, uh, the NAND solver here I'm using FM, EM, and it doesn't do, uh, it doesn't do sensitivity. But I can plug into uh, abstain by calculating the final difference of the sensitive parameters, and we can still make a reasonable inference in the reasonable amount of time, in the finite number of amount of time. And actually, this is 3D problems with multiple uh, degrees of freedom per each node, and you can fairly, and they actually solve it in a fairly small amount of time. Uh, so what's all this about? In, in engineering application, for example, this is a classical problem of making uh, Bayesian calibration. You have a simulation problem, you have a simulation solver, and you don't know the, uh, the parameters that you should be using. Uh, but you, ha you can collect the data from the real world, right? For this problem, this is a civil engineering problem. Uh, example, right? You can solve it. You, 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 uh, civil engineering, uh, civil engineering knows this. OpenCC is actually a very popular solver in civil engineering. Uh, I'm working with uh, one of the developers here. Uh, he wants to know, okay, I have a structure model. I have a model of a building. And my solver can solve the problem, but I don't know the actual material. Oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, the material that I should plug in, okay. I can, I can solve this problem by solving the, uh, the so by plugging this stand solver and, uh, and making inference of the actual material here. So I'm solving a beam problem and I can make inference about the beam by observing the, uh, the, the dif displacement and rotation of the beam. That's the real problem and here that's what we got. So uh, that's all I have uh, that more stuff in the poster and uh, if you're interested, we're moving on to solving bigger problems but the challenge would be uh, we need some kind of surrogate reduced water modeling. And uh, in biomedical context, we'll be solving a tumor growth problem, uh, hopefully within the time limit of next stand come. Thanks. Hi, I was uh, stood like a gooseberry at the last one, um, but I've actually got a slot now. Sorry, it's going over. I haven't got any slides, you'll be pleased to know. Um, my name is Oliver, I'm from Manchester Metropolitan University, and I'm a psychologist. Does anyone else in here identify with psychologist? Great, one, two, three. Okay, hi, hi. Okay, so um, psychology, as you may know, is uh, very much uh, Bayes' curious at the moment. Uh, there's a group of people who think it's the answer to the replication crisis, and there's some who hate it as if Fisher was still alive and well and living in their cupboards. So um, what I was hoping to do was um, so, sort of get a bit of a Bayesian Trojan horse into some of the high-impact journals in psychology. So I've created um, a registered report, which is another one of the solutions to the so-called replication crisis, where you get your, uh, your introduction and your review uh, and your analysis plan all done, uh, like pass through review before you collect your data, and then you collect your data, and they have to publish it, basically. So I've done a Bayesian analysis plan for this, and it's on my poster at the moment, and I've got uh, code on a virtual machine, which took me an immense amount of time, and I doubt anyone will even look at, but I can actually just print it off or send you the GitHub link or whatever. Um, so please come and say hello. It's a virtual reality study looking at how, people's, um, uh, how people uh, exercise more or less uh, if they see themselves losing weight or gaining weight in response to that. It's like a replication extension. Thank you very much. Cheers. Uh, spotlights for this time. And so now coffee break and see you soon. I would say let's start the afternoon late session. Let's start with uh, Paul Berkner and uh, some updates on customer response distribution with BRMS.
I'm not sure. Ah, now it's working. So welcome everybody to the next afternoon session. Uh, I must say that after hearing those interesting talks, I wanted to switch fields from psychology to, let's say, astrophysics or anthropology. But sort of, I'm psychology, so I'm not doing psychology. I'm doing stats, basically, um, to make that up. Um, so today I want to talk about custom response distribution in BRMS. And um, BRMS is sort of an R package of mine, more or less my baby. Um, so the idea of BRMS is to have sort of one great framework for kind of for all kinds of regression modeling, but using Stan behind the scenes to make everything sort of work in a Bayesian framework and make it efficient and stuff like that. And so I want to push the boundaries of what can be done within R and within R formula syntax in terms of flexibility. And one thing to push the boundaries even further is something I want to talk about today. Um, this picture is actually not related to my talk, I just like it. So that's, uh, that's a Gaussian process, so different kinds of Gaussian processes for three different groups based on some simulated data. I think we can generate this with like three lines of code. Um, fit the model and generate that, that kind of plot. Uh, and BMS also has a dark ggplot theme in case you like that. Okay, so um, today I will be talk about sort of custom response distributions. But before we can talk about sort of custom response distribution, what's a response distribution? That's basically sort of the P in the likelihood, right? So P of y given theta and, you know, the li response distribution links the, the data, the response to, to our parameters, basically. And um, so in, in R, they're called families, so families of distributions, and there are lots and lots and lots of those distributions. Uh, for instance, some basic ones are Gaussian, Poisson, or Gamma, that's the perhaps most common ones, or binomial, perhaps. And um, so misspecifying the, the family uh, so may seriously distort your results. So mostly in psychology, everything is assumed to be normal, whether that's true or not. People don't even know that they're assuming it to be normal, or they don't care. Um, perhaps it's similar in other fields, but in any case, sort of um, having or using a reasonable response distribution sort of is important. And so it's important to BRMS as well. So BRMS currently supports up to, I think, 37 response distributions to date, perhaps if you ask me in, in a month, there will be more. I don't know, but, but still people sort of ask me frequently, can I use BRMS with other families, with my own response distributions that are not currently coded? So I want to use all other kinds of convenience functions in BRMS, all the um, nice R formula syntax, all the post-processing, but I want to use my own response distribution. And so fortunately, you can do that. And today I want to show you with a little example of how that's done. Um, so here's a, here's a case study. Basically, I just um, I like the data set because it produces nice plots. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's about housing rents in Munich. And um, so there's, I think, a few thousands of rows. And in this data set, we have, among others, the rent per square meter um, per, per basically house or flat or whatever, the area, the, so the size of the flat, the year of construction, and the district in which it is in Munich. And the goal of this data set or this case study is basically to predict the rent per square meter by area and construction year while also controlling for sort of the district we are currently in. And so we, when we ask sort of what kind of model should we apply, we should first think of, so what's rent per square meter? So, it, so it's something that, that's roughly continuous and it, it's possibly not smaller than zero, right? So using a normal distribution is slightly inappropriate because we have sort of this lower boundary at zero and we have likely have sort of an right, upper right tail, sort of very skewed distributions. So we could think of perhaps using a gamma distribution for that. I'm not saying that's the best option or reasonable option, I'm just using it for the case study here. So we don't have to talk about this formula, it's just the, the density of the gamma distribution in its usual parameterization with alpha being called a shape parameter and beta calling being called either scale or rate, I'm not sure what that parameterization is. But in any case, you know, this, this, this parameterization doesn't make much sense when we want to use it in regression modeling. So we reparameterize this. So, so why does it doesn't make it sense? The mean, which we call mu, 
of this distribution is alpha divided by beta, and the variance which we call, call v is alpha divided by beta squared. Yeah, so, so if we want to do regression, we usually want to predict the mean or the median of the distribution. Um, so what I've done in BRMS and other packages do that as well. They, instead of predicting alpha and beta, we are predicting mu and alpha. So that's not the best option. I will show you later on, but that's one option so that we can at least predict the mean mu. Um, so given that kind of parameterization for the gamma distribution, we can readily fit a rather complex model already to this um, data set by using an R, the BRM function, which is, you know, perhaps you've, you've seen that yesterday in the workshops um, of Ben Goodrich, um, sort of used to fit all kinds of models in BRMS. Um, so we have the rank per square meter on the left-hand side of the tilde. So we are, this is the stuff being predicted, that's the response. And so since we don't know how area uh, and construction years related to the rank per square meter, we just fit a spline. In this case, we are fitting a two-dimensional tensor spline, which we can use via the T2 function. Um, behind the scenes, there happens to be uh, MGCV, the MGCV package of R doing all the kind of complex stuff I don't understand, I don't care about. I just care about the input and the output. Um, okay, so two-dimensional tensor spline, and then we have a varying intercept of district. So that's the sort of usual syntax in R to specify varying effects. And here, the one stands for intercept, so we are fitting separate intercept for district to at least control for some differences of districts. So the uh, data set is rent 99 because it was in the year 99 in Munich. And the family is gamma log. And log basically tells us the link function of the mean parameter mu. Um, so because the linear predictor in any kinds of regression model is usually between minus infinity and infinity, so we exponentiate it to make it positive. Otherwise, the gamma distribution will fail. Okay. So we fit this model. It runs rather fast. Um, and that produces that kind of nice plot with one line of code. And what we see here, sort of, um, it's color-coded, and the color-coded is the rent per square meter as predicted by the model. And on those two axes, x and y, we see those predictors. So for early construction years, rather young buildings and small areas, we have the highest, or at least the model predicts the highest rent per square meter. So I'm not saying that's basically a reasonable prediction for all for all, uh, all over the space because, you know, splines don't generalize necessarily beyond the, the area where we have data, but in this data set we actually have data mostly all over this, this rectangular. Um, so we see it's by no means linear, the relation between construction and area. Um, it's really interesting to see and also nice looking um, that for early construction years and sort of small areas we have the same. We have the, the highest um, rent per square meter and very low rent per square meter for rather large and old buildings. Um, the question is that's perhaps not all we can, can do with this kind of data. Um, so what if we um, want to predict both the mean and the variance? Right now we were just predicting the mean and the uh, shape parameter alpha was just being constant across observations. So that model was not, not only boring because it was too simple, but um, you know, now we want to do something else. We want to predict the mean and the variance. So unfortunately, in the usual parameterization we were using before, um, so that the variance v was quadratically related to the mean parameter. So, so that's kind of weird, right? Um, so we, to, in order to predict mean and variance separately, we want to actually be able to predict mu and v directly. And we can achieve that using a reparameterization. So alpha is set to mu squared divided by v, and beta is equal to mu divided by v. I hope that's correct. Um, at least it tends to work out. So perhaps I'm wrong. Um, but, but still, the case, the case study is useful in that case, I hope. So, so now that this is not the distribution we have in, in, in Stan directly. That's not the distribution we have in BRMS directly. So we have to specify that ourselves. And, a little bit of stand code, fortunately not too complicated, so that's a custom LPDF function, which I call just gamma2. And gamma2 is just like gamma with alpha and beta, but now with this reparameterization. So, so that's rather easy to get a custom response distribution, of course, for more complex things. It will look more complex, but 
with regard to BRMS, it doesn't really matter as long as we can code the log density in Stern this way. Um, so now I want to put this um, Stern function into BRMS, and that's how we do it. So we have to specify a custom family, so our own family, basically, um, and we have to specify a few things, basically. So the name, which is gamma2, and this has to be exactly related to the name of the Stern function, which is gamma2 underscore LPDF. Um, then we specify the distribution of parameters, d pass, which is mu and v, just our own choice. And we specify the link functions we want to use, so that we want to use the log link or the exponential transform for both of those parameters, because both the mean and the variance are positive um, in a gamma model. We want to say sort of what kind of response distribution do we have? Is it a real or integer value? So is it continuous or discrete? Okay, it's continuous, so we call it real. And we say that both mu and v have a lower bound of zero. Right? So we don't actually need that just for completeness here. And then we, because we are working in R, we just put our um, custom sort of um, user-defined stand function into a string uh, to, to, be, to be able to use it from R. And so that's basically what we need. Um, okay, so now we specify our, our custom model. So first, since we want to predict both um, the mean and the variance, we have to specify two formulas. So one um, is for the mean. So we're using, again, this tensor spline with a varying intercept of a district. And we want to use the same kind of model for the variance v, so which gets its own tensor spline and, again, its own um, varying intercept across districts. And then there's one addition which we don't need, but I just added it here. Instead of having one pipe, we have one pipe, something that doesn't matter what it is, uh, and, and a, again a pipe, that means that those two um, varying effects will be modeled as correlated. So it really doesn't matter what there is in, so it could be I don't like Bayesian statistics, with some, some minuses in between, it works, right? <laughs> I've tested that, but it was too long for the slides. Um, okay, so, so that's, that's our model, two formulas, we wrap it in BF to have multiple formulas, and then we have to find a way to get our custom STAN function into the, into the STAN code BRMS generates behind the scenes. And we're using the STAN var um, function for that. And then we put everything together into BRM. So we're using this formula. We're using the data set. We're using our custom family gamma uh, two. And we're using the STAN vars object in which we put basically our um, user-defined STAN function. So that's everything we need. So that's, I think it's the minimal information BRMS needs to get that working. And when we fit it, it fits a little bit slower, still a few minutes, but sort of it samples nicely. And again, we get some nice plots. So that's again the plot for the, for the mean here. Um, so that's not too much different. But we also get um, predictions for um, the variance. So we see here that the variance of the uncertainty Right, so after fitting the model, is most so this is highest for older construction years and small buildings. So some of them are very expensive, perhaps some of them are really cheap. Um, and here in the middle, so for large area for large um, houses, so built around 1960, there's basically not much variation going on. Yeah. So we had fitted two separate splines using a custom family in um, BRMS with a few lines of stand code. There's a whole vignette about that kind of stuff, explaining how to use custom families. And there's also this case study, which we will publish online along with all other case studies, um, or all other talks, basically. Um, so uh, suppose we want to do model comparison. So suppose we want to compare all our two gamma models. Um, so what, what we could do is, we, for instance, we could lose approximately one our cross validation with a loo function in R. Um, but for, for in order to that, for that to work, we need sort of the log likelihood of our custom family, and we can simply you know, specify that as well. So it's log underscore like underscore name of our custom family. Um, so with, I think, a three or four lines of code, so not too much. And you can look up how that, that looks like in, um, in the case study and also in the, 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 the source code of BRMS. And we just need this function, and suddenly, sort of our new custom model also works with this approximate leaf-warner cross-validation. 
and I know Aki doesn't like Lua IC, but since, since you know, I'm happy when people understand what an information criterion is. And when I then sort of force people into understanding what an LP, ELPD is, sort of, then it gets even more complicated. So, so I'll, for now, I stick with Lua IC until Aki sort of forces me. I'm not sure how, but he, he will try to force me to get rid of that. Anyway, smaller values are better. So we see that the, um, our custom model fit two actually has some somewhat better fit. Um, so perhaps it was a good idea to also predict the variance. Um, I guess that's it. Thank you. There was a question before at the back, but I'm never going to make it. <laughs> you can see why I failed basketball. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you for a very interesting talk. So this was just a, a comment, really, rather than a question. Um, it's just with kind of um, distributions on the positive real line, like the gamma distribution, you can't really get around the fact that the variance is affected by the mean. And so one thing you can do, and certainly with the gamma distribution, is you can model the mean and the coefficient of variation. So I think with the gamma distribution, uh, the coefficient of variation is one over the root of the shape parameter, and then the two are completely separate. Okay, yeah, so their different distribution was just an example how to, you know, use a custom family, but yeah. Um, yeah, just a small question. I didn't quite understand what you said about the two pipes and the P in the middle. Can you go yeah. back to that slide and... Yeah. Uh, Okay, so, so we have two varying effects in this model about district. So one is the varying effect of district across the mean, and one is the varying effect of discrete, uh, dis district um, across the variances. And so we have multiple varying effects over the same grouping factor, which is district, but you know, in multiple of those formulas. So I just sort of invented a syntax to make them correlated, if you like. So by default, they will be uncorrelated. But if we, instead of having one pipe, we write two pipes and then adding the same thing in both of these expressions, so let's say P, then they will be modeled as correlated. So that's just an, another sort of syntax thing to, to be rather flexible in how, wh what kind of varying effects will be correlated. Hey, um, just a quick question about um, what if I'm like careless or malicious and I just don't put in a proper uh, density function, but some, some, some other thing. Would it just break on me or would it like sneakily still work? So likely it will fail. Um, that sort of as Michael Bitoncourt puts it, sort of when, when there's something misspecified, you know, Stand fails horribly, and that's a feature, right? Yeah. So, you, so you know when there's something misspecified. So, so I don't know. Whatever you, some, it may sort of give you results, but sort of I can't stop you from putting putting there something that that doesn't work. Yeah, should I mean I didn't mean it in that way that you should stop me, but just like I'm just curious if, if it would. Or not. Yeah, we, we we hope that it fails. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. I'm afraid we should be moving to the next, unless there is some very short question. No? Okay, thanks, Paul. Next one is Christian talking about clinical trials since then. Thank you. So imagine going to a, uh, a Bayesian conference and talking straight after Richard McElreath and Paul Berkner. Hi, I'm Christian Brock. <laughs> I'm a clinical trial statistician. Uh, I work at the University of Birmingham. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, some clinical trial dose finding designs that I've implemented in STAN. So I'll just give a, a whirlwind tour of clinical trials. They're essentially um, sequential experiments on human beings that ultimately aim to improve the health outcomes and 
they basically go in phases. So uh, phase one studies, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, are basically dose-finding studies. And uh, the challenge there is to kind of escalate the dose of a treatment in pursuit of something good, so some kind of efficacy. But of course, there's the, uh, the continual sort of, uh, the other side of that coin is toxicity. You don't, you don't want to go so high as that you start harming people. And that's basically the trade-off in phase one. Phase two studies take that dose from phase one, and they kind of ask the general question, does this thing do anything good? It, you know, is it worth investing in further to go to a phase three study, which tends to be expensive, takes a long time to run, takes a lot of patience. So phase three studies can really be interpreted as being a bit like a title fight, uh, if to borrow an analogy from boxing. You know, you can't go straight in and start fighting against the champ, but you have to earn your way there through phases one and two. But when you get there, if you basically, if you vanquish the standard of care or, or, the, or the reigning champion, you sort of take that mantle on yourself. Phase four studies are, are basically post-marketing studies whereby the, the drug is, or the treatment has been adopted in general use, but there's long-term uh, follow-up going on for like rare events and things like that. Now, clinical trials tend to go into the news uh, for one of two reasons, really. Um, the, the, the first general case is, is phase three, and that tends to mean that something really good has happened, so we've got a new standard of care, something brilliant's come along, you know, we can all expect to do better when we get ill with this, with this disease, and, and maybe a pharma company's going to make a lot of money, or, 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 or sometimes the opposite, and the phase three trial fails, and then stock prices tumble. But the other sort of large uh, uh, thing where, where clinical trials hit the news is, is phase one studies. And that makes me a little bit more nervous because when phase one studies are in the news, it generally means something's gone disastrously wrong and, and that people have suffered. But essentially, dose-finding designs exist. They're statistical designs in nature. They, they exist to sort of make phase one studies more safe, more scientific. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a few of those. So the sort of the standard paradigm of dose-finding is to, is to, to dose-escalate by toxicity only. Now, undoubtedly, if you were to pick a dose-finding trial that's taken place and been published in history, it would almost certainly use what's called the 3 plus 3 method, okay? Or some derivative of it. And it's really simple, it's not statistical, and it goes like this. You, you select a dose, so dose level one, say, you give it to three people in a cohort, and you evaluate each of those people to see if they have some kind of toxic reaction or not. So you can see in my first cohort of three, the green dots mean they didn't have toxicity. And so the algorithm then says, let's go up to the next dose. We'll give dose level two, give it to another three. Uh, and I'll say in my scenario here, one out of those three people has a toxic reaction. And so to that, the algorithm says, ooh, I'm not so sure about this one. Let's give it to another three. And so straight away, you can see where the name three plus three comes from. Um, so it goes to three more people and they're okay. So then the algorithm says, one out of six is fine. Let's escalate. It goes up to dose level three. Okay there, escalate again, and then at dose level four, you see the two red crosses, so two out of the three people had toxicity, and then the algorithm says, okay, that's enough, stop, we've gone too high. Dose level three is the one you want. So that's three plus three in a nutshell. Now, you know, there are some pretty obvious problems with that, not least that it's memoryless, so it's, it's not using all of the cumulative data to make inference about any particular uh, dose level. It kind of throws that information away and makes decisions based on just three or six people. So you can imagine what performance is like. Now, you might well sort of imagine, uh, surely folk aren't using methods that simple in clinical trials. But depressingly, they are, even now. So this was a, 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 a systematic review that was published in 2017 by Chuzan et al. And theirs was a methodological systematic review. So they wanted to find out the methods that people are using. And something similar happened about 10 years ago. And that they sort of really followed up on it in light of all the modern treatments we have in cancer. And they looked at every dose-finding study that was published between 2008 and 2014. Now, there are a lot of them. They found 1,700 uh, trials that were published. But the depressing bit is that ni a whopping 95%, so about 1,600 of those papers used a rule-based design of the ilk that I just talked through. And only 5% used anything sort of model-based or t statistical in nature at all. And they concluded adoption of model-based designs continues to remain low. So I've talked about model-based designs. You know, what, what, what is there out there? The, the, perhaps the, um, of, that, of that class, the, 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 the most well-known is one called the continual reassessment method, or, or just commonly known in the, in, the industry, in the industry as the CRM. And what it basically does is it asks uh, investigators to specify their prior beliefs about the rate of toxicity at a discrete number of dose levels that are going to be investigated. So here I've, a, I've just given a five-dose uh, scenario. 
and the prior dose tox curve is there in that sort of pinky color, okay? So, so it's monotonically increasing. Higher dose is always associated with a higher probability of toxicity. And you're also required to sort of stipulate the target level of toxicity that you're looking for. So that's by the dashed red line. And that's sort of, sort of chosen for, for clinical relevance or, you know. Now, essentially, the, 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 you know, the trial sort of uh, proceeds and the people are, are treated at doses and the model's updated. And the specific uh, mathematics of that, there's actually a few different models that are used. One of them's a logit model. There's a, uh, a sort of one called an empiric or a power model. Um, and the details of that are in the, in the, the R notebook I, I, I submitted. But, but suffice to say that they're generally very simple uh, models. They tend to use one or two parameters uh, with priors on. And let's say, that, you know, let's just say we, we sort of gave some doses to people and we saw more toxicity than we were expecting. Sorry. No, lower. Let's say, we, let's say we saw lower toxicity than we were expecting. The, the update process sort of, what it takes that, that prior curve and just shifts it down a bit. And then you can see when that happens that the, it intersects the dash line at a higher dose. So dose escalation is sort of advocated and it proceeds like that. Of course, it, it could have gone the other way. We might have seen more toxicity than we were expecting. And in that scenario, the update process, the, the posterior uh, parameter values would shift that curve up so that it intersects the, the, the target line at a lower dose and de-escalation is, is advocated, okay? So that's, broadly speaking, how that works. Here's um, uh, uh, some results from an actual trial, okay? So this is from 2006. And it shows uh, the, the, the results at the end of a trial that used the CRM, a one-parameter CRM model, it used uh, 18 patients. They investigated five dose levels, but actually only gave three of them to patients. And, and these are the, the, the results they had at the end of their trial. So when they called it quits and gave a recommendation. But they wouldn't have had this chart then, I don't imagine. But I don't actually think there was an MCMC implementation of the CRM back in 2006. And even now, when there are... MCMC implementations. There are versions of it in, in bugs and, and JAGs. It's quite a well-known model, and it's, it's been implemented a lot. I, I think I'm maybe the first one to, to actually bother publishing a version in STAN. I did that mostly for completeness. Um, but, 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 you know, even now when there, there are those MCMC methods, the, the, the sort of most popular R package that does this, this method is actually just uses numerical integration to sort of estimate posterior uh, parameter means and plugs them into the function values. So sort of doesn't really do the posterior sampling and you wouldn't have this kind of, I don't imagine they would have had this kind of violin plot back then. But, but why is any of this important? Well, just looking at that chart and bearing in mind this is where the clinical trial ended and you're basically choosing a dose for the next stage. The, the investigators in this trial chose dose level four, which is fairly non-controversial, right? Because the target line intercepts the, the posterior predictive distribution right through the middle. So the, the, you know, the expected value is about 20, well, 33% is actually where their target was. The mass for dose level five is all above the target practic, well, most of it is. The mass for uh, dose level three is mostly below the line. So you're looking at that, or at least I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, if I had to estimate the probability that dose level four was the correct dose, uh, what would I be estimating? And I'd sort of look at that and go maybe, I don't know, like 80% perhaps, but of course, <laughs> well, not of course at all. So here's the same data uh, plotted in a different way. These are the, uh, so, so the, the benefit, of course, of working with, of sampling this model in STAN is that I get all those posterior samples for my parameters. Now I can take each one of those parameter values and calculate the implied dose toxicity curve. And I can do that for all of the values and I can overplot them like this. And then what you get so you're just reading across from the dashed line, you can see looking at the points where they intersect, there are actually curves generated that advocate choosing dose levels two, three, four, all the way up to five. Um, and that gives a hint to the sort of the level of uncertainty that's still, still within this clinical trial that maybe perhaps wasn't noted at the time, I don't really know. Um, now, now you can't tell just from, looking at a, uh, just from looking at that chart, but I've actually calculated it. So 50%, just over 50% of those generated lines suggest dose level four, which means about 50% of the other ones suggest something different. And in fact, dose level three is, is recommended a quarter of the time. So there's still a lot of uncertainty there, right? I'm gonna get off uh, 
toxicity chasing escalation and, and move on to a slightly uh, newer topic. This is dose finding by toxicity and efficacy. So up until now, I've just talked about uh, toxic reactions. I haven't actually talked about efficacy at all. Now, don't you imagine you'd want to sort of use that information when you're finding a dose for a drug that's going to go into people's mouths, right? Well, why is that? Well, here, here the, sort of the backbone of cancer treatments up until now for decades have been largely chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is what's called a cytotoxic treatment, which means that it attacks tumorous tissue and healthy tissue alike. So you give chemo to a cancer patient, their tumor gets smaller because it's being attacked by, by, by the chemo, but also their hair follicles and, 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 and their gut lining suffer, and that's why they get sick and they lose their hair. So... Toxicity and efficacy with chemo are very much two sides of the same coin. You sort of bear one in pursuit of the other. Well, modern treatments work slightly differently. Um, and to, to try and persuade you, and not just to, to, to give you my opinion, so remember me talking about Cody Chuzan's systematic review where they found 92 papers that used a model-based design? Well, um, a student and I just recently downloaded each of those manuscripts, and we took out the, uh, the dose toxicity outcomes and the dose efficacy outcomes, and I analyzed all those together using hierarchical models, fit using the RMS, of course. Um, and so there are, um, don't say random effects, there are group level effects for, um, for, for the intercepts and the gradients, and, um, and I, I added some group structure for the, the drug type too, because that's kind of important. And, and what you can really see there, so the colors represent uh, uh, different types of drugs, and, and I've stupidly omitted to include the, the color legend. But, but on the left-hand side, you've got the, the fitted dose toxicity curves. And so what you can see there is that the, the dose toxicity is very much a you give more, you expect more toxicity relationship. That's not really up for debate. It's, it's plainly true. But the right-hand panel shows the, the, level, the, the, the rates of response in increasing doses. Now, there's a lot less data here because dose-finding studies don't tend to think about efficacy so much. But it's a pretty ten, tenuous message, isn't it, that, that efficacy is associated with higher levels of, of a dose. It's, it, 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 it's basically absent in lots of the fitted curves, and it is present in only a few of them. Um, and those brown ones actually are chemo. The, that's what the, the, the beige lines are. And so I would say in that kind of context, if you don't know that you're getting better efficacy for higher doses, doesn't that sort of behove you to at least put it into the model and allow it to, to feedback to make sure you do the right thing? And in that vein, um, uh, here's another dose-finding algorithm that I've implemented in STAN. This one's called FTOX. And like the name suggests, it uses efficacy and toxicity outcomes in dose-finding. But of course, now you can see it's a two-dimensional problem. So you've got dose levels associated with rates of toxicity and efficacy, and you're trying to choose between them. So that kind of makes you, it forces you to, <clears throat> to think about kind of some kind of trade-off between the two. And that's, that's exactly the route that, uh, that Tal and Cook uh, took with their design. So you can see here, I just made up some data and fit it to the model that they kind of describe in, in one of their papers. And the, the red numbers actually show the locations of the dose levels with respect to efficacy and toxicity on that sort of two-dimensional plot. Now, what we want, ideally, this is a laser pointer, isn't it? Let me see. What, this is the, 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 the holy grail over here. We want treatments that are associated with perfect efficacy and zero toxicity, but they don't exist. So you're basically bearing one in pursuit of the other. But the nearer we can get to this lower right-hand corner, the better. So the, the method they've got is that they have these contours of attractiveness. Uh, and they give you a method for specifying those. And basically, the closer the doses can get to this corner, the more attractive they are. So the trade-off is, is, is more desirable. Um, and you can see here, uh, you know, I just invented a couple of outcomes, turned the handle, and those are the fitted, beg your pardon? Those are the fitted, uh, fitted values. So just to, to sort of echo uh, the th same theme again, so what's the benefit of having it in STAN? Well, again, it's about having access to those posterior samples because they allow, to my mind, they allow quite a rich level of inference and, and sort of decision making. So here's a, a matrix that I ended up developing whilst we were using this design on a real clinical trial. Uh, and, and the design would, would advocate a dose for us, and that's fine. But I kind of wanted to know, you know, how sure are you? Or, or what kind of confidence are you putting on this recommendation? Um, you know, looking at the previous slide, is it really that, 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 that several doses are almost as attractive as each other, or do they stand quite distinct? And so, of course, with the, the STAN fit, uh, I'm able to take those, the posterior generated distributions of the utility scores, 
and then um, basically ask the question, what's the probability that one dose is superior to another, conditional on the data we've seen and the model, which I presume we're accepting because we're using it. Um, and so I've color coded them there, right? So you can see that with confidence, we could say every dose is better than dose level one, but three, four, five, they basically have scores that are pretty close to 0.5, so it's essentially a coin toss. So the, uh, the, the design's not too sure at all there. And I ended up reporting stuff like this in the sort of standard uh, reporting to our monitoring committees just to kind of convey the level of confidence that was in the model. Because, and this was one of my peer review points for this submission, we, we don't tend to run trials as if they're run by robots. These are very much like recommendations and ultimately the decision comes down to what a clinician feels comfortable with doing. And this kind of information uh, c can only make that decision better, I'd say. Um, so I said that this is all in um, an R package. My R package is called uh, Trial R. It's on GitHub, and it's on uh, CRAN as well now. Uh, and just there's some code there about how I fit some of the models that I've shown today. Um, and just to, to dwell a little bit on um, future work. So Trilar is a basically a dictionary or a cookbook, if you like, of, of trial designs. And there are lots more to do. So that'll be my, my sort of obsession with the next year is to add a few more designs. But, but of, one of the awesome things I think about working with uh, Stan is, is the sort of richness of the ecosystem that's building up around Stan and all the different packages that are all being developed in parallel. You know, we just heard from Paul and, um, and for example, TidyBase uh, went on to uh, CRAN recently and that's like really useful for me because you need to drag out the sort of, um, uh, you know, your fitted values and do stuff with them into ggplot. So I plan to plumb that in properly now that it's on CRAN. And then, of course, visualization. I very much like, so I have to convey these things to clinicians who, you know, they're not statisticians. And so the way to sort of convince them is to show them plots that are intuitive. And being able to produce those quite nicely is a big deal for me. So I want to do a lot more with um, Bayes plot, for example. Shiny stand could surely play a role. And then, of course, the idea that, you know, in trials like this, where you end up doing the same thing a lot of times and you have to produce kind of documentation, the idea of generating automatic reports is really attractive. So something like flex dashboards could be a, a big thing. Um, I've probably run out of time. Um, so just to recap, my name is Christian Brock. You've been very attentive. Thank you so much. Happy to take some questions. Uh, thank you, very interesting. Uh, if you could back, go back to the previous slide, please. I'm just curious, because all those in line, what is it, uh, 26 until 30 or something, they are all priors, or uh, does yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, how did you choose them? So, so <clears throat> the FTOX model, what it does is it uses six parameters. Three of them are in the efficacy model to basically get this non- um, non-monotonically increasing shape, so it uses a, a quadratic term, so it can have like kind of a turning point, but, but not quite a plateau. Um, there are two terms in the toxicity models, so basically an intercept and a gradient, and uh, there's also an association parameter, because it's a, it's a co-primary outcome, so it would be intuitive to imagine there's some kind of association. Now what Thal and Cook do is that they choose normal priors on each of those uh, parameters, and um, they also give an algorithm for sort of selecting those priors and they, uh, they, they sort of use the effective sample size um, arts type of argument to say how much information is in the priors. Um, I, I sort of haven't broached all of that. All I've done is just, is just literally replicate the logic. So, so each of those, alpha mean, alpha SD, those are just the, the, the normal um, hyper prior parameters. Uh, and that, so you can see there's six lines of them there for the six parameters in the model. Um, uh, am I right in assuming that you have assumed that the patients are interchangeable? Yeah, so there's a homogeneity uh, assumption, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. How easy would it be to vary that? Um, so, brilliantly, because, it's, uh, because of how easy these types of things are in Stan, I think quite, quite simple. Uh, and it's something I've thought about since I've coded it up. Um, so other people have gone down that route. There have been CRM for sort of... Um, you know, subgroups, if you like, where they sort of borrow information about slope terms, but there might be this subgroup and that subgroup, for example, molecular sort of genetic information. So I think it's quite simple. Um, yeah, that's something I'd like to do, actually. Okay. Thank you. 
move to the next speaker to keep the time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay, you can sit again, but you can still stand while I'll, I'll before Bob starts. So we, uh, I also, people ask from me that what's happening in Stan and when that feature and that feature is arriving and have we thought that, this and that. Um, it's possible to also follow what's going on if you follow Stan Discourse and uh, Stan GitHub, but it takes a bit of time to follow all this. And so the idea was that uh, Bob gives summary, but then uh, in addition, when you have questions, there are other developers helping then answering what's going on and what estimated time frame for different things. And you can go a bit over time, no worry. Okay. Uh, especially with the questions, I mean. Okay. Yeah. I will try not to go over time here. This is, this is fun. Like, I normally put all the stand development team up here, and like at least half of us are here. All the people in bold are actually here at this conference. So I'm Bob Carpenter, one of the original developers of Stan. And I'm going to try to tell you about sort of the roadmap for where we're going with Stan in terms of the core bits of Stan that are written in the C++ infrastructure. Jonah's actually going to be talking tomorrow about what's going on more on the Stan interfaces side on the R and maybe on the Python side. So I would like to thank everybody here who's helped to make Stan. So I think we're finally to the point where we've got everything modular enough that lots of different people can work on Stan at once. And when Aki said it's hard to keep up with, that's a bit of an understatement. It's more or less a full-time job now for me. So the most recent thing that happened, so I'm going to start with what just came out, which you may not know about because it hasn't filtered through all of our interfaces. So we just released Command Stan 2.18 about a month ago, and it's got lots of new features, which I'm going to tell you about. Command Stan is out. Our Stan is not out yet. I think PyStan 2.18 just got released last week, so I think we're, we're set with that. And we have a 2.19 in the works that I'm going to tell you about queued up right behind that one. So the most important thing that has happened in the last year or probably the last four or five years for Stan is that the multi-core processing has finally landed. So now we can finally do MapReduce type operations within a Stan evaluation of the log density function. So we've always been able to do parallel chains, but now what we can do is we can take a single chain and parallelize the operations inside of it. So mainly what this means is taking the log density calculation, distributing pieces of the log density calculation over different cores. And these can either be multiple cores on a single machine with shared memory, or they can be multiple machines on a cluster, ideally with good communication among the machines. It can also be run sequentially. So if you write your code to exploit this stuff, you can run it either multi-threaded, or you can run it um, with a single core. With, there's actually speed ups with that because of memory locality that's going on. Turns out the modern computing, all we worry about for speed is basically branch point prediction, figuring out which way an if is going to go, and memory locality. So we can bring gobs of memory. And it's really slow going out to memory to get data. right? And it's really slow if your processor guesses the wrong way as to which way you're going to go. The nice part about this is it's nearly embarrassingly parallel. right? We're getting speed ups of about factors of 60 with 80 cores on complicated problems, problems that take a lot of time. This isn't going to make your 10 second model go in one second. It's going to make your 10 day model go in a couple hours. right? So it's multi-process parallelism. So we're implementing it with MPI under the hood, which is mainly what implements this kind of stuff under the hood. It's a very low level interface. Runs cross-platform. We've tested it pretty thoroughly on Linux and Mac. Not sure if all this stuff's going to run on Windows. It's based on a general, it will if you're like a configuration genius. Like it's actually standards compliant, but getting Windows to deal with standards compliant thing is challenging, right? And it's based on a general higher order map function. So when people are talking about map reduce, what they mean is they have some function, they're going to have some bunch of data, they're going to divide the data up into chunks and apply that function to each chunk. Right, so basically we have some function f, we have some list of things, and map just distributes that over the pieces, right? 
Architecturally, what happens is we're going to be pushing the data out to the processor. It's really important to get your data close to your CPUs because data transport is much more expensive than computation. So pushes data out to the processors once. Then as it's running, it's going to push the arguments out, and then it's going to get the result back and the gradient back. So it's a very thin communication channel, which is why this is so parallelizable. And then everything gets integrated back on the on the core server that's actually doing the auto def, right? And Sebastian Weber did a lot of work on this. Sean did a lot of, Sean Taltz is here, did a lot of work on the actual design for this. And like most stand features, lots of people have their hands on it, testing everything else. So we're all very, very excited about this. So what this actually looks like in Stan is that you write a function f that can be mapped, right? And what it's going to apply to is it's going to apply to a first argument that's shared data a second argument that's the thing that's actually getting mapped, and then like our ODE functions, some fixed data of both a real and integer type. I've actually got some really exciting stuff coming up next that's going to clean up a whole bunch of this interface. Then the higher order map function, the thing that, actual, that you actually call is this function map rectangular. Like everything else, we tend to roll things out pretty conservatively with things that we know we're going to need because we're really concerned about supporting backwards compatibility. We don't want to roll a bunch of stuff out and then say, ah, that was a really bad idea. Sorry, now everybody go change all your code. Um, so we try to be pretty conservative. But of course, we can't see the future, so we wind up deprecating stuff. Sorry about that. The map rectangular takes the system function in that's going to be mapped. It takes the shared parameters phi. It takes then three parallel arrays, an array of vectors of parameters, an array of real arrays of data, and an array of real of integer data. And then the results computed just like in the theoretical map function. Right? Map rec takes this function and then it just applies piecewise through. Right? This is a very, very general way to divide your likelihood calculation up. It's not pretty, um, but we're going to be working on more automation for that. Um, we added a bunch of new built-in functions in 218. We have now a multivariate normal RNG and a Cholesky RNG. We're trying to get everything like all the corners and everything straightened up with all this stuff so people aren't surprised when functions don't exist when they go and expect them to. Many of our RNGs are now vectorized and the rest are going to be coming soon. We've got the thin QR decomposition. We've got the matrix exponential multiply action, which like speeds up linear ODE solvers. Um, the Adams ODE integrator, which is now going to be available. Um, Generalized log mixture function beyond two arguments, a standard normal that's a little faster, and finally we got around to vectorizing the ordered logit, and somehow somebody snuck in the vectorized ordered probit that I didn't even notice till I was looking at the logs of what changed. So now you can do vectorized probit too. Um, one of the things that I've personally been working on, because I do a lot of work on our manuals, is we've been converting them all to HTML. So in 2.18, the Stan reference manual was converted to HTML, but the user's guide isn't going to be converted to HTML until the next version. The cool thing to look forward to about this is Andrew uh, Gelman has taken this under his wing and is now working furiously on adding new introductory methodology material to the front of it that he's using for a master's level, an upper undergraduate level course that he's probably going to be teaching like next week or something starting. So we're getting that all rolled up. So there's going to be much more expository material up front. And we're going to actually put a lot more effort into the user's manual in terms of bringing it up to our current standards and adding a lot of things that aren't there. So I'm glad people like it so far. It's going to get a lot better over the next year because we're going to put a lot of effort into it, Andrew and I, working on it. Um, so, improved effective sample size. Oh, I took everybody's name out of this because I decided it's really hard to attribute this stuff to people because so many people work on it. But Aki's been working on uh, improved effective sample size calculation. It turns out nuts is so good that it can sometimes do better than random samples. The idea is if you take draws from across the, you take anti-correlated draws instead of correlated draws, your effective sample size rate can be higher than your actual posterior draw rate. Um, and there's a really cool sort of case study on our discourse that Aki did 
calibrating all of that stuff to show that it actually works. It's nice working with all these like super careful statisticians. I have like high confidence and high trust that the stuff we're doing is actually going to work. And then of course Aki then went and pushed it through all of our interfaces, which was really cool. So what we're trying to do is like gradually get people to start contributing code. They, you know, people are like, I don't want to code. That takes a lot of time. And then we see that they have skill and we start like giving them more things to do and they get more engaged. So. So we also added for each loops. So this is something that's like a C++ 11 feature, but we're gonna be able to do in stand now. So instead of just iterating over numbers, we'll be able to iterate directly, saying something like for matrix Y and Ys, do something with that Y rather than having to pull everything out by index. So just a convenience feature. Um, the data qualified arguments that somebody was mentioning for ODEs, those are already out. Um, Mitzi added those to the, to the language. So you'll be able to write something like this logistic uh, GLM function, and you'll be able to specify that there's real data for the predictors, integer data for the outcomes. This is the kind of function, right? This is the way you'd write a function to actually be a map function. So this would be the kind, this would be the function you'd need to write to parallelize logistic regression. Thought I'd kill two birds with one stone there. So a lot of bug fixes, a lot, especially a lot of stuff in the parser with error messages and boundary conditions and weird edge cases like initialization wouldn't continue if you failed in constraints on the transform parameter. So we gradually fix all of this stuff as, as it comes up. Some of it's easier than others. Um, now exceptions in the generated quantities block that used to just completely trash sampling because we didn't know how to recover. We just decided, well, we'll just write not a number everywhere. Close enough. A um, lot of math library enhancements here. Um, more covariance functions. Um, we're working to add a lot of covariance functions that will be automatic. But the more exciting stuff I don't actually have here. We were just like working it out with um, Andre Zappico and um, Aki in his office a few days ago. So you can go to Aki's office and look at the board for our real future plans. But the exciting thing is we have a way that we think we're going to be able to do really large scale GPs, things like 5,000, 6,000 predictors, right? Like that, like that size, right? We're going to be able to do the birthday problem. Well, maybe those aren't really, really large. Are we going to be able to do the birthday problem? Maybe. Okay. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> I won't oversell it. Um, it's going to make a lot of a lot of GP stuff easier. Um, and then we're, gonna, we're actually going to roll out a, G, a set of GP primitives that will let you define elements of the GP functionally the way our other stuff works, like our ODE integrators and our map function. That will let us scale. It's not going to be a lot faster than what we do, but it's going to let us scale it because it's going to let us like grow the memory, solve a little derivative, sock that away, do another derivative, because there's like millions of entries in these covariance matrices when you've got thousands by thousands of elements in your GPs, so going the wrong way. So is that right? Yes. So command stand, we're actually working more on command stand now. So we're allowing um, the mass matrix specifications, which is helpful. So what we've been encouraging people to do largely is scale all their parameters to be unit size, but with a combination of being able to specify the mass matrix that you start with or the inverse metric plus initialization, you'll be able to deal with some of that stuff without actually changing your model. And you'll be able to restart, which I don't think is as useful as people think it's going to be. Um, we also have a little pre-compiled header support. Um, so that's what's, what came out now. Big thing is MPI to, to realize that we can do parallelism. So now what I'm going to do is move over to what the immediate short-term holds. This is going to be probably stuff that's mostly going to come out in the next release after 2.18 and 2.19 or very soon after that. Right? GPU support, the other thing that's super exciting. The really cool thing about GPU support is it's independent of MPI support. So we're going to be able to run models that actually spread over multiple cores and on each one of those cores delegate down to GPUs to do our matrix calculation. So we're using OpenCL for double precision and almost all the GPU developers are here. Rock and Eric and Steve and Sean are all here if you want to find, find out more about that. Um, OpenCL we're using for double precision arithmetic stuff and for portability. So we'll actually be able to run this stuff on our Macs and stuff without having to have an NVIDIA card. Um, the initial rollout's probably going to be in stand 219. We may eventually write a CUDA interface. I know Eric and Rock were talking about it. Um, and the initial rollout's going to be for things where there's a lot of data 
and where there's, um, sorry, I got this backwards. It's actually n squared data in cubed computation, where there's where the computation size dominates the data size. But again, here we're going to be able to ship the data out to the actual processors, pin it on the, pin it on the GPU processors, at least for simple things like this, and get fairly big speed ups. And the nice thing is we're doing this at double precision, so we're not going to lose precision here. A lot we do big Cholesky decompositions and things. It's very hard to do stably at single precision arithmetic. So we're going to be rolling all this stuff out at double precision arithmetic. Here was one of the charts. Like, there's lots and lots of case studies and evaluations on our discourse uh, forums on the developer um, topics if you're interested in following along. So this is two different speed up curves. M's the size of the um, matrix. This is a Cholesky decomposition. And we're looking at two different things. One's a GPU and one's a GPU version where we have to copy all the data before we decompose it. Right? So if we just have all the data out there, it's one thing, but if we have to actually copy it all out, it's a lot more expensive. So whether we're going to get these speed ups or not is going to depend on what exactly you need to do with it. The big speed ups are occurring when we have to do derivatives as well. So if you just need to do this for double values, that's one thing, but when you need derivatives, we can really speed this stuff up a lot. So we're also working on much more general basically calculus support of various kinds. We're doing PDEs, differential algebraic equations, and definite integrals should all be rolled out fairly soon. I think the DAE stuff, I know the definite integral stuff's already been merged. I think the DAE stuff's either in process or about to be merged, and the PDE stuff you heard about from Yi earlier because he's the one working on this. So we're going to have pluggable versions of this, and it's going to extend the kind of algebraic solvers that we have. I'm actually not enough of a mathematician or statistician to have any idea what I would do with any of these things, but I hope you understand these things better than me. I'm looking at the code as it goes in and the interfaces, but this is like hard math for me. Um, getting back into stuff that I know more about, um, we're going to be making a lot of updates to the language. So Mitzi just got done refactoring sort of the back end, which is going to open the way for us to be able to add this to the existing language. And there's three big features coming up in the language that are probably going to take, you know, six months to a year to get them all done. The first one's tuples, which are basically product types. They look like dictionaries or something, in, or lists in R, if you're familiar with that, but they're typed. So everything in STAN is strongly statically typed. You know the type of everything when, it's, when the program's written. So a tuple is basically going to specify what the types of its elements are. So like an eigen decomposition operation returns a matrix of eigenvectors eigen and a vector of eigenvalues. So we'll be able to write that function directly, and we'll be able to access things by doing dot one, dot two. We may add names to this. It's still a little up in the air. I'm not a big fan of names, but a lot of people have been twisting my arm to do that. Um, and we'll have constructors, like we have array and matrix constructors to actually be able to build tuples like this. This is going to be helpful in a lot of ways that may not be so evident from simple functions, but a lot of our infrastructure is going to be cleaned up by doing this, and a lot of the more complicated stuff is going to be cleaned up by doing some of this stuff. It's funny, it's like I know they're coming and I'm refactoring a lot of our old code, and I'm like, ah, oh, too bad they're not there. I really want to use tuples for this, so they will be super useful when they show up. So ragged arrays is something, though, I think everybody can understand the utility of this. Right now, there's a chapter in the manual on how you have to hack this up with one-dimensional arrays and do all the slicing, which is really ugly and really error-prone, right? It's nice when your models are readable. When you have to do all this kind of slicing, like poor Richard had to do in the model he talked to us, it's like it becomes hard to read that. It becomes hard to read it and realize that things are doing the right thing. So the one thing you realize when you start doing a lot of code and you start doing code professionally is the most important thing about code is being readable, right? Because the thing is, it doesn't have to just run and work. It has to be maintainable, which means other people are going to have to read it, which means both other, really other people and you in the future. So we really want to be able to make this code readable. So a lot of the effort we're putting in is trying to make things simple. And we have a lot of work to do on like the data formatting and that, and that kind of stuff, which we're not doing doing well, I think, yet. It's possible, but it's really fiddly. Ragged arrays is going to make this a lot better. We're going to have arrays where 
elements of the arrays don't necessarily all have to be the same size. So when you have different numbers of observations for different numbers of individuals or other items, we're going to be able to code this up directly so you're not going to have to be slicing everything out. And it's going to have, again, everything's going to be strongly statically typed, so we're still going to be talking about this. We're still going to be specifying the raggedness in the declarations for these things. Right? The other thing that we're going to be able to do, which is really cool, so from a developer perspective, now that we have C++11, it is like Christmas has come, right? And all these things that were like super painful to do before, we can now do. Some of those are going to propagate through into really cool stand features. One of the things we're going to be adding pretty soon is lambdas with closures. So we're going to be able to, this isn't necessarily the syntax that we're going to use. This is just sort of like the C++ syntax for this. Um, and similarly, not the syntax for typing and things like that. We, we haven't decided exactly what that's going to be. But because C++11 implements closures, we're just going to be able to implement those directly in the language. What that means is we're going to be able to write a function like you see up here for defining cube. So this kind of behavior is probably familiar if you're used to writing functions in R, right, where I define an integer like n, and then I can define a cube function. Basically, that cube function says, take an R, a real argument x and return x to the n. But you can see that if I just think of that as a function definition, that n isn't bound anywhere. That n's going to be bound by the closure to whatever the value of it is in the environment. Right? So you're going to be able to do that in Stan. You're going to be able to pick up parameters, pick up data, things like that through closures, so that your functions that you write for things like ODE systems or for maps are going to be able to implicitly have that stuff in it rather than having to pass all these packed around things in it. So we have independent generated quantities written. It just needs to get pushed through the interfaces. So I think the last talk was talking about how, how much easier it was to do all this, do all the inference post-processing. What we're going to roll out is an ability to take an already fit set of draws and write a new generated quantities block and apply that. Because you don't always know what inferences you want to make ahead of time. But it's nice to be able to write it in the stand language. When you have to go write this stuff in R, you've got to deal with making sure you do the right thing distributing all the draws through and also make sure you get the right parameterizations of gamma and negative binomial and all that stuff, which like I don't ever want to have to do again in my life. Um, but of course, every time somebody says, hey, I'm trying to implement this paper and it has a gamma negative binomial, why doesn't it work? You're like, okay, let's get the algebra paper out. Um, this will make it easier to make everything consistent, right? We also need to do the same thing for doing simulations. Like right now, it's not super easy to like simulate data in STAN and then fit data in STAN. It's a very awkward sort of process where things have to be written twice. And Andrew and I have been thinking a lot about that because we're trying to write up teaching materials based on simulated data, fitting simulated data, and it's kind of awkward in STAN the way it is right now. Um, so that just needs to be pulled into the interfaces. Here's something that's a low-level infrastructure thing that's going to be game-changing for us and is actually going to lead to much faster multivariate operations and more scalable operations for, from a user perspective. So we've got a new way of actually writing. I didn't talk about this in the course about how to write a C++ function, but if you're thinking about writing a multivariate C++ function in STAN, this is the way to do it, where basically all you're having to specify is basically an operator, a functor that returns the value and perhaps does some storage of things on the way, and then something that knows how to do, how to multiply the adjoint times the Jacobian. This is actually the primitive operation that's going on in autodiff everywhere for doing multivariate autodiffs, right? You're basically taking you're taking a vector of grady you're taking a vector of adjoints of the parent derivative and pushing it down through the jacobian the nice thing about this is we don't need to actually go store the jacobian which can be really big if we've got a matrix to matrix operation it's n squared to n squared the jacobian is size n4 right and each entry in that jacobian is like 40 bytes Right? So this is going to be a big savings because we're going to be able to do some of our operations more lazily rather than storing them out more easily. Some of that we've already coded by hand very laboriously. This sort of automates all that laborious stuff that we do. So you can thank Ben for this because he's been working on this. And it's even cooler because I'm getting to another slide later to show how much easier it's even going to be than that. 
Like, this is pretty simple. You just write a simple functor to do it, and then all of a sudden all the autodiff works for you very efficiently. But it's going to be even cooler for multivariate operations. So I'm really excited about this from a developer point of view because it uses these, these cool parameter pack things from, I'll, I'll get to that, I'm jumping ahead. So we're going to be able to do mass matrix and step size initialization. This is, again, already built into the C++ core. It just needs to be pulled into the interfaces. This is what I was jumping ahead to that I'm so excited about, which Ben figured out, which is variadic functions rather than packing. Right? So if you look at the map rectangle that I just showed you before, it, like our ODE functions, required you to pack up parameters, pack up data, pack up um, everything. Right? What we're going to be able to do in the future is you're still going to have to pack up the rectangular thing that gets mapped as part of the theta, but everything else is just going to be able to be spread out. The system function itself, f, is going to be the thing that applies to all of those pieces. So it'll just implicitly match up all those arguments with the other arguments that you need. Also, you'll be able to do some of this stuff with closures once we get there as well. Similarly, integrate ODE will look the same way. We'll be able to take the ODE integrator and pull it out like this, right? So that you'll be able to just add the arguments rather than having to do all this packing and unpacking stuff. So, longer term, this is, this is short, the shorter piece, so we'll get to wherever we're going next soon. One of the things that we really need to work on is faster compile times. Unfortunately, C++ compile times have just gotten slower as the project has gone along. All kinds of cool new template metaprogramming stuff, but the actual compilers themselves, even for the old code, are getting slower. Right? They're doing better optimization, they're doing all kinds of other cool useful stuff, but they're getting slower, which means every time somebody says run Stan, right, it's like now you're like not just getting a cup of coffee, but you also have time for a donut and a phone call or something. And we don't, you know, we really don't want that to happen. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be pulling out the templated model class that we have. Everything gets compiled as a single translation unit now, if you know what that means in C++. Basically, whenever you compile a model in Stan, you are also compiling every piece of the math library that you need, the optimizer, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and variational inference all get compiled every time you touch a model, right? What we're going to do is separate that stuff into separate translation units so it will be much faster to compile. This is all conditional on it not losing a lot of speed because we don't want to lose a lot of speed from lack of inlining possibilities. So how far we're going to be able to take this down the matrix library depends on efficiency considerations. But certainly we should be able to separate the model and the algorithms and things like that out. Right. We'll try to pre-compile as much of the math library as we can. Right. The more exciting thing on the future is a new version of the Stan language. So we've pretty much converged after a lot of discussion on a rough diagram of what Stan 3, the language, is going to look like. This is largely based on a woman named Maria Goranova's um, master's thesis. Um, she's off doing an internship with the Google people now, so she couldn't be here, but she's going to help us work on Stan in the future as well, because she's really good at doing lots of stuff, apparently. And um, hopefully she'll work on this for her dissertation. But she figured out a way, she wrote something called Slick Stan, which she talked about at the Asilomar StanCon, which actually showed you how to take Stan and unfold it to remove a lot of the blocks that are currently there in Stan and essentially make Stan code look more like Edward or PyMC3 code, right? There's a bunch of benefits for this, right? I wrote, when I first sat down and wrote the Stan language, my, one of my main motivations was that I found bugs. Remember I said programs really need to be readable? I found bugs and JAGS programs really hard to read. Right? I couldn't tell. I would take the thing, and since none of the types were declared, you'd have to like, look at the data, and you'd have to say, OK, the data is this. Here are the parameters. And you did this like zebra puzzle of like the Swede smokes Paul Malls and lives next to the Norwegian. And you're like, OK, this thing's a vector, and you'd go on. So I wanted everything to be declared. The thing I thought we would get tons of pushback on was separating the data and the parameters block. So one of the really nice features of something like bugs or jags is that it's a runtime decision which things in your model are data and which things are parameters, right? It just defines a joint density and Bayes is great. You can just invert it based on anything you know and do inference about all the things you don't know, right? We can't do that in Stan. With the blocks, you're declaring what the data is, declaring what the parameters is, which makes it easier to understand a model for a single use, I think. 
At least that was the motivation when I wrote it that way. But it makes it hard to do the models flexibly, and it actually has a couple negative consequences, which we've realized as we've gone and made bigger and bigger models here. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to no, have basically no more required block declarations. You'll be able to do them optionally, but we're going to be able to infer almost everything from just writing a program that looks a lot more like Bugs or Jags or Edward or PyMC3. Right? One of our main motivations here is that there's no way in Stan currently to write a function that does something like a non-centered parameterization. The problem is, is that the non-centered parameterization introduces a new parameter, it introduces something like a new transform parameter, and it applies some priors. There's no block in which that thing can go and stand. It operates over multiple blocks. So one of, the, one of the driving factors from Maria's design and sort of designs we were looking at before she kind of figured it all out was something that would let you write a module for the non-centered parameterization which would like do the right thing. Right? This was inspired in part by composability and language theory as well. We want to be able to take stand programs and say, here's the first half of the program, here's the second half of the program. What do they mean when you put them together? It's just function composition. Right? From a theoretical computer science point of view, this is like a very good property for your language to have, for it to be modular, for it to be understandable. So we're applying a lot of these kinds of design principles behind the scene. Um, and it was partially realized by transpilers. So you can see, um, sorry, I wrote Stata Stan there. I meant Scala Stan. So Scala Stan is a completely, Stata Stan is one thing. You can talk to Robert Grant who wrote that, he's here. Um, Scala Stan was written by this company, SIBO, because they wanted everything to be an embedded language in Scala. They believed in Scala so much, they were like, we're gonna rewrite the entire Stan compiler, code generator in Scala. Right, which they did, it's really cool. And what they did looks kind of like our new design for Stan. It's not embedded in Scala, of course, and it also looks like Maria's uh, thesis, which was on Slick Stan. Right, so here's an example, after all of that blather, of what things will look like, and I can talk about why this is gonna be helpful. So I think what's useful about this is it allows us to write the model down sort of in the generative order from the parameters out to the data in a way that actually puts the use of a variable close to where it's declared. So one of the principles of programming, like when you start getting into programming, there's a lot of programming design, right, and how to write a program. It's like writing. You can like learn how to write in elementary school, but it takes a lifetime to be able to like express yourself very clearly. And there's basic general rules that you learn when you do this kind of thing. And one of the general principles of programming is that you want to declare variables as close to where they're used as you can. You don't want to have a hundred variable declarations up top and then miles of code and then where you see them later because then you're always jumping back and forth. Uh, Maria was partly motivated by Andrew Gelman complaining about this and wanting to be able to write the priors right where the parameters were declared. He's like, there's the parameter, why can't I just write real mu tilde normal zero one? And we were like, well, no reason, right? Other than we haven't implemented it, but that's not very general because you're not gonna be able to do that with data, right? Which is where you really wanna do that. So this form of linear regression is just lays out the exact generative story that you have. You say we've got a couple coefficients, alpha and beta that are normal, right? We have some data. We have some unmodeled data for our predictors, x. We have some predictor mu y that's alpha plus beta times x. Then we have our noise term, sigma y, or our error term. And then we have our regression term y there, right? And you'll notice that there's no declaration of what's a parameter or what's data. I think we're gonna be able to figure all of that out at runtime the same way Bugs and Jags does. We'll be able to look at what people give us as the data and be able to say, okay, they gave us y, they gave us x, everything else has to, be, has to be a parameter and we can use the techniques in Maria's thesis to do that. We're also going to allow declarations and we're also gonna support backwards compatibility. I should have said that first. Your existing models won't break. You're going to be able to write them just the way they are. We're gonna be able to allow these, these statements to be block constrained. We'll be able to say data vector x, right? and that will force it to only be usable as data. And we're gonna be able to 
I think what we're going to do is say data in parentheses, you know, in braces, write a whole bunch of stuff just like you used to do, and then they'll all be data qualified. So I think we'll have no problem maintaining backwards compatibility. Right? Here's an example of what the non-centered normal module will look like. Right? This is basically doing a non-centered normal parameterization. Right? We have a number of coefficients. We have some kind of real um, location parameter. We have some kind of real um, scale parameter, sigma. And what we're going to do is we're going to declare a parameter alpha standard and give it a standard normal distribution. And then we're going to declare a declare, we're going to declare a transform parameter alpha and define it to be mu plus sigma times the standard value. Right? Then we'll be able to use this non-centered normal module down in the actual code. Right? And we'll be able to pull out bits of it like non-centered normal dot alpha, right, to use later on. Right? And we'll have flexibility about which arguments get passed in and how they're actually accessed there. This isn't all set in stone. Sean, I think, is taking the next step of doing the concrete language design, and Matthias is trying to make sure that we can actually do everything Maria did in her thesis. So this is probably going to be like a year-long project or more before we get like a first prototype out that really does this like effectively that we're going to be like releasing or, you know, and that may be optimistic. We'll probably have prototypes, and we love getting other people to work with us on this. Couple other changes, right? That was it for the language, by the way. Protobuffer IO, I think we're going to switch to data structures. We're right now using this really janky R, hacked R format for our input data, right? So when you specify data for a stand model, you're actually supplying it using this like weird R format in both for command stand, for instance. And what we need to do is move to some kind of more standards-based data input format. Right, so this is right now we have this R dump format, which I didn't quite realize just how bad it was when I when I started it, because I R doesn't actually produce it consistently. So Ben and Joan or G Chang, whoever wrote it, had to actually write a specialized output to override R's output, so we could actually produce the thing that we were trying to produce. Right, but I think we'll we'll switch this to something like a protocol buffer JSON uh, input pretty soon. Um, what we've decided to do, though, which I don't actually have a slide here, which is like halfway between this slide and the next slide, is something we just rolled out a design for, that Sean just rolled out a design for, which is we're going to be replacing a lot of our internal I.O. with something that looks much more like a logger. Right? If you're familiar with other kinds of server-type software, messages typically come along with logging messages, and you're able to say, hey, only show me things that are like error messages or above and turn everything off. This is partly going to be useful for user level control and for the interfaces to be easier, but it's going to make our lives as developers a whole lot, a whole lot easier on the inside. Um, we also, one of the things we want to do is work on program transformation. So part of the language is we want to be able to like reduce common sub-expressions. We want to do all the fun things that everybody who develops compilers do. We want to be able to eliminate dead code. We want to transform locations. We want to automatically vectorize. We want to see if you do log one plus alpha, that it should really be log one P alpha. All of that kind of stuff. So we want to transform for arithmetic stability and for optimization. And to do that, we really need to generalize our abstract syntax tree away from the really complicated C++ data structure that it is right now. So I hope I didn't go over too far. Yeah, a little bit. Thanks. Okay, and um, before you all have to leave, you have to take an exam. Fill in all the points which are forthcoming. Yeah. <laughs> Where's this one? Uh, cool talk. Um, a couple questions. One is um, for the, the MPI uh, map stuff. Um, how much overhead uh, is, is there in that? Like, how liberally can we start? Uh, using that in our stand programs? Um, there's actually sort of negative overhead in using it. Because what, what happens, like a lot of efficiency comes from memory locality. And what Sebastian found is that after he built it, even using the map function with, even if you weren't parallelizing it, 
What it does is the way it's implemented behind the scenes is during that map function, when it's mapping, it's actually doing a nested auto def and actually computing the partials of the result with respect to the input on the fly. So instead of building up a really big expression graph that has all that stuff in the inside and causes a lot of memory non-locality, instead what's happening is we're taking those nested expressions, evaluating them in a tighter scope, right? So it's actually less, of, you would think there'd be more overhead because you have to like copy things into arrays and out of that, but it's actually a net win because it helps with memory locality. Um, but you're not going to see like speed ups for really fast programs, and you're not going to see speed ups if it's like super, super granular, okay. right? You need to divide it up into, you know, chunks that take some time, okay. right? If you're going to actually parallelize and get speed up, everything else is going to be like not enough to even worry about. Uh, and the other question is that, that so that Cholesky graph, that's for when the um, Cholesky is a parameter? Uh, you can yeah, I think I actually labeled that wrong. I think what was going on is that was the speed up for when you're doing derivatives. I don't, our Rock and Eric were sitting there. Do you want to answer this one, Rock? Sorry. Uh, I, don't, I think the, the graph is not for the derivative. This is, this is super old. Uh, I'm going to, we're going to show some of the results tomorrow okay. on the Cholesky with the latest graphs, but this is not the derivative, this is the, the basic function. The input is uh, eigen matrix okay. that's copied to the GPU and copied back and so forth. But, but the speed ups are yeah. similar. Yeah, it's, it's like a 30 or 40 times speed up for Cholesky with derivatives, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Because when a, you couple a, that with like the 50 times speed uh, up of doing parallelization, now we're like talking. We yeah, that, that's on a like a $400 GPU. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's also GPUs. You can spend, you know, you can get a cheap one in your computer or you could spend $10,000 on one and get, you know, we're, we're all going to get P100s or whatever those things are <laughs> next, like $10,000 GPUs that are really good for this kind of double precision stuff. Oh, by the way. Eric and Rock let me know about this great program from NVIDIA. So if you want to like, if you've got like a legitimate use, write to NVIDIA. They have a developer program. They'll just send you like a $1,500 graphics card if you work at an academic institution and say, I've got some app. Like Andrew and I both wrote and they sent us like two weeks later, they sent us a couple of graphics cards. So we're just like, we're developing it for Stan. I said, and Andrew said, I want to fit big hierarchical models. And they're like, here's your GPU. <laughs> so, <laughs> so ask NVIDIA, they will, they will give you GPUs. <laughs> so with all this um, changes under the hood, uh, what's going to happen with the forward mode auto diff and uh, whether Riemann will ever, you know, be born? Oh yeah, I, I didn't even talk about that. But one of the other things that Ben's done, like everybody should know Ben, he's been doing like rock star level summer programming <laughs> over the start. We have the, the parameter pack stuff that, that's going to deal with the multivariate and the variadic argument stuff is actually giving us a way, we have a design now for actually testing all the matrix library. So Riemannian actually works and it's part of our distribution, but you can only use it through C++. Part of the things that we need to do for that is figure out the build time. Right, so what's gonna have to happen is we're gonna have to not only build reverse mode, but also build forward mode nested in reverse. So it's probably gonna take like three times as long to compile. So we don't wanna just do that automatically. So there's some sort of distribution things we have to work out, like how it's actually gonna get called. But my guess is probably in the next five or six months, we'll have that ready to release, right, to be used. Now, having said that, the only thing it's gonna be really useful for is really, really hard posteriors and fairly low dimensionality. Um, and we have not put it all the effort that needs to go into that for adaptation, right? So Michael wrote this really cool, Michael Betancourt wrote a really cool soft abs thing that will do the actual metric estimation, but one, we haven't evaluated that on a lot of problems, and it's got a couple tuning parameters that we need to deal with, right? So it's gonna come out in probably a crude form to start, and then we'll 
hopefully get more experience. But it will be useful in like small parameter problems with, and the amount of data doesn't matter, but there's a cubic operation in the number of parameters in the middle. You've got to eigen decompose the Hessian of the parameters, recondition it, put it back together, and take gradients of that, which winds up being like a cubic operation in the number of parameters. So you're not going to be able to use it with like 10,000 parameters or probably even 1,000. Um, any requests? We, we do take requests. <laughs> Incoming. Uh, sir arrived. <clears throat> I hope everything's okay. Uh, when you are going to introduce the slick stan, yeah. will it be like backward compatible or how going to you design? It's, it's absolutely going to be backwards compatible. We are not going to break anybody's existing models. We're going to allow um, data parameter, transform parameter declarations to be given optionally or they can be inferred, so if you, and if you provide them in a block, it'll look just like an existing program. So, yeah, that's a, that's a big concern for us, so. Arya's already asked one, right, so. Okay, everybody yell before throwing this so that, uh, who's in the back? Arya's already asked a question. I can talk to him anytime. <laughs> Um, is there any interest in uh, the STAN team implementing stochastic mini-batch methods like we're seeing from the TensorFlow probability team and PyMC3 folks? Um, yes. Um, the problem is they don't work, though, very well. So, for instance, insider information, I went out and talked to Matt Hoffman and the BaseFlow group earlier this year, and what they told me is they are moving away from stochastic gradient mini-batch methods because they're not stable enough for their problems and moving to things like LBFGS like we're using or move so in fact we're probably going to go the other way and like take the take the optimizer and make it not stochastic inside of ADVI um, and instead go the other way um, partly on Matt's advice that it's not working for them either um, it does like it's it's one of these things that you can get to like Breck and I did a lot of playing around with stochastic gradient it was what I was doing before I started working on Stan and it's a nice technique that requires a lot of human tuning. So it's a lot like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, like bare Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. When you find the right tuning parameters, it's like magic. But that involves step size, sort of the step size annealing process for that. You can't just like plug in the um, Robbins Monroe thing, takes forever. Theoretically, it works. So everybody winds up hacking like exactly the, the learning rate and things like that. So it's a, it's a hard thing to control. So if somebody can figure out how to do it robustly and with good control, we'll add it. But I think probably we'll be going the other way rather than looking at more like Newton methods and can we use more second order information rather than like can we mini batch. But there's a lot of interest for that among people, especially among the machine learning people on whether you can do that. So because um, what, what had happened is like when Alp and Dustin built the first version of ADVI, they actually evaluated it with mini batch stuff, but they hacked a version of Stan in the C++ and it never got through to the interface because they basically went off and did other things. So. That ADVI thing reminded me this uh, one forthcoming thing is the diagnostic for ADVI. So there's also pull request, so maybe okay. it's in 219 that when you run ADVI, it will tell you if it doesn't work. Oh, excellent. I that out. I've got like a bunch of papers from Aki and Yuling and other people queued up on this. So I don't know how long we want to keep uh, people here. So one more and then uh, we had Burton and Burton better. Okay. And I will tell you a little bit about dinner, but yeah, I think you were the last one incoming. Alright, I have I have two requests. One is um, stochastic differential equations. Mm-hmm. And the other is, uh, can I have the Hessian back when I run BFGS? Um, so I get, I guess that's the second order. Um, yes, when we get higher order auto diff, we'll do that. You can get the Hessian back through R, but it's done with finite differences mm -hmm. at the moment. So you can do that. But we're thinking a lot more about Laplace approximations for things now that we've got Dan Simpson but, back there so engaged. And, but and in BFGS, you're building up that approximation, so you don't have to 
as you're optimizing, you're building up this part of BFGS. But it's a, it's a, we're using a fairly limited memory approximation of that thing, and it okay. never gets built up explicitly okay. in LBFGS. It's all implicit in the, in the limited memory formulation. Okay, okay. So okay. And stochastic the Hessian will be fast enough that it won't be a problem when we can auto diff it, and it'll be a lot more accurate. Okay, and stochastic differential equations? That you should probably ask Yi about <laughs> back there. Are we going to do that, Yi? Uh, next, next year. There you go. <laughs> Yi's been just cranking through. I think we're already done with all of our deliverables for our grant. We'll go on to like extra credit <laughs> next year. Uh, okay. okay. So that was last question for this session. Uh, last question for this session. Let's thank Bob again. And we, I, we can thank also all other developers bringing all this new stuff there. So uh, if you pass the exam, uh, you will get to the boat. And so this is the picture which has been on the StanCon webpage. And you can see the restaurant is on, on that one of the, the island there. And so you have to get somewhere here uh, where the boat is. <laughs> and then the boat takes you over. And um, so the easiest way, so we are here now. There's a tram stop very close. Tram number two takes you very close. The name of the stop is Olympia Terminali. <laughs> but I guess you understand the beginning uh, from Olympics. So if you see something, Olympia, and then a lot of letters afterwards. <laughs> You are already really close, and from that stop you should be already able to see, see the sea and then uh, the islands, and if you walk towards the sea, you will find then the pier where the boat takes you. And it was also now that this person better in a way that it can continue after you form the groups. You can also work together or take the tram together. It's three kilometers if you want to walk, but since tram, it goes every 10 minutes, it might be easier choice. Okay, Greg? Okay, we have 10 birds of a feather groups. If somebody forgot and wants to do one right now, you can bolt down here and I've got a pen and a blank sheet of paper. All right, but we're gonna do them. I'm gonna put them out along this edge. If you're the person that gave, came up with the idea, please come down here and stand next to your piece of paper. All right, and hold it like this, okay? So people can come to you, all right? Don't start running around too quickly because it's gonna get noisy. Okay, here we go. Diversity is here, Lauren. Environmental scientists, here. You're going to collect yourselves here, figure out what you want to do. You maybe meet tomorrow, it doesn't matter. You're just going to find, this is networking, meta-networking, I guess is the way to think about it. I'm not sure what to do with this one. Aggregating ratings, judgments, expert surveys, modeling precedents, and multivar sequences. Good luck. I don't know what to tell you about that. <laughs> Stand three, language, design, discussion, here. Structural equation modeling, here. Survival models, tackling the baseline hazard and doing Bayesian model diagnosis, here. All right. Forecasting, time series, extending profit for fun and profit. Yuck, yuck. There we are, there. Okay. Surrogate models and interpretation. Uh, that was, uh, there was a request on a, 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 a treatment here. <coughs> oh, almighty. I, I got excited. Featuring Space Bayesians, British account, accents, and ye. There you go. And we have Speeding Up Stan on Parallel Computation. I thought it was computer, but whatever. And GPUs. 
And we go to ah, the importance of being Bayesian, the Stan movie. And we're going to cast, I think, as Andrew Gelman, I think, I think George Clooney maybe, Brad Pitt. In any case, I'm actually working on a Stan movie. Andrew really wants one. If you have any interest in an animated one or a live action one, or you have anything to do with movies, you know anything about movies, come talk to me. All right? That's it. See you at the restaurant. So, uh, up, up. So, so, so we have, uh, we can stay here, uh, but just remember that we would like to, you, uh, to have you 7 p.m. at the uh, pier, and so that if you are at 7 p.m. there, then everyone would be 7.30 at the dinner place. But otherwise, you can decide with the group you are forming, how long you are here, and how long you spent going there, and so on. Thank you. See you at the dinner. Oh, more? Wait, wait, wait. Uh, so if you have been asking about uh, certificates that I've been telling you all day that Aki still need to sign them, um, you can come see me like now or in, in, uh, at the dinner, and I can give them to you then. All right, thanks. <laughs>